Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Tuesday, September 17th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, editor, the Jacobin magazine, Bhaskar Sankara on the Socialist Manifesto. Meanwhile, day two of a massive UAW strike against GM and 80,000 Kaiser Permanente workers planned to strike in October. Meanwhile, Trump's National Labor Relations Board's second attempt at rolling back worker protections from franchisees thwarted again. North Carolina Democrats sell out everybody except for them exact selves. Trump calls it Saudi 9-11, and the Pentagon says, whoa, 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 whoa. Ayanna Presley to introduce Kavanaugh impeachment resolution in the House today. The Manhattan DA subpoenas Trump's tax tax returns in the hush money payoff scandal. Elizabeth Warren draws 20,000 in New York and a dubious WFP endorsement. And the acting head of the Directorate of National Intelligence has until today to turn over that compelling whistleblower report as mandated by law. We're just going to have to testify in front of Congress on Thursday. All this and more on today's program. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is Tuesday. Welcome. Everybody's here. You will notice that we have a a Chiron on our show today, reminding all of you that October 11th, right? Is that the date? October 11th? I believe so. Let me double check that and also bake the Chiron. Oh, okay. I guess that that fell through the cracks. Um, That the... um, Registration deadline for New York State is imminent. October 11th. October 11th. And uh, so if you want to vote in the Democratic primary, you need to register if you're not already registered as a Democrat. Always also a good idea just to uh, call your local board of electors and say, hey, am I uh, registered? And just uh, confirm you made your polling place. Definitely. Also, New York is super weird and very funky in terms of things. So basically, it's register by the 11th if you're voting for Sanders. If you're voting for anyone else, it's the 15th. I don't know why that is, <laughs> but just, just so everybody knows. Classic. Um, there is actually, I believe, a bill. Andrew I mean, Cuomo. Yeah, the Cuomo's. It was good. It was. <laughs> well, I, I was going for voter fraud, not a cheap punchline. But uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, is holding up a bill that I think would expend, uh, that would give another several months, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I wouldn't doubt it. He was talking about trying to, um, at one point he was contemplating rolling up the uh, primary and making it uh, happen in February, as opposed to, I think it's April now. Now, it may seem ridiculous to you. Why would you need to register by October 11th if the election i believe is around april 11th and you would say to yourself don't they have the technology like how slow are these computers uh that have the voter rolls does it really take six months for it to uh, catch up no it doesn't i mean that's the the 
Uh, New York for a long, long time has been uh, somewhat corrupt in that way. And uh, we see this also, I mean, frankly, this is something that is uh, just intrinsic in many respects to um, politicians. You know, we were talking about Nancy Pelosi's um, refusal to sort of unleash impeachment and um, in many respects, you know, the, the, that sort of iron law of uh, institute, you know, people will want to protect their power in an institution uh, even more than the institution's power. And in North Carolina, the state Senate and House have both uh, voted on new lines for districts. As you recall, a superior court in North Carolina found that the districts were um, unconstitutionally state constitution uh, gerrymandered, unconstitutionally gerrymandered. And uh, I think uh, the Republicans decided not to fight it because they also probably had wind of the fact that uh, their their boy Hofstetter or Hoffletter or whatever that guy's name was, who was the grandfather of gerrymandering and died in his... Hoffeller? Uh, Hoffeller and his uh, daughter found all his records on his computer. Um, they voted on uh, new lines. They have to reconcile them between the two houses. But as far as I can tell from following uh, some uh, local North Carolina reporters. One is uh, Stephen Wolf, and uh, the other is a guy named Will Duran, who's uh, half of North Carolina Senate Dems largely voted for the Republicans' new modestly less gerrymandered map, likely in part because some Dems got favorable seats to protect. And put more explicitly by um, by Duran, the real message coming from North Carolina's Democratic State Senate leader is that they'd prefer their own seats remain safe, even if it means the entire map still has gerrymandering to favor Republicans. Putting themselves before their party and their voters. Um, Trash. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, this is a problem with human beings, <laughs> frankly, in my opinion. Um, Hashtag not all human beings. Not all human beings are bad people. Let's put it that way. But. Um, problem with the Democratic Party. I well, I mean, that's not I mean, they're not doing a favor for the Democratic Party. I mean, no, 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 no. no. You're misunderstanding me. There's too many people inside the Democratic Party that center their own uh, immediate interest over any type of broader strategy. Yes. Um, I suspect that um, that is... Uh, it's not unique to it. But not it's, unique it's to the Democratic Party. But, it's, but, it, but I do think there's less of a culture of that right now in the Republican Party, as an example. Oh, I think that's absolutely and the so case. It's, it is this, yeah, it's they not are, unique, but it is a problem, too. They have... Um, um, I, you know, I think that tends to be when there's more money, frankly, uh, involved, uh, people tend to go along uh, much more. There's a lot less independence uh, in some respect. And by independence, I mean both in a, in a good and bad way, in the sense that, like, I'm going to protect myself if there's not the same amount of resources uh, that I can get by going along. So um, it is a, a, indeed a problem, though. Bad. Very bad. Not good. Very um, bad for you. All right, but some good news. Well, not. I don't know if it's good. Oh, we'll we'll get to the UAW strike uh, in a bit. I mean, uh, this is we're in day two. My understanding is, well, let me just read this, and then we'll do the uh, UAW strike um, video because this is apropos of the um, the interview we did with Rect over vacation, which if you did not listen to it about this book about the demise of the u.s car uh industry and it at uh, their demise as a function of their attempting to diminish worker power just i want to read from this reuters report it's talking about um 
some 50,000, almost 50,000 U.S. hourly workers at GM, represented by the UAW, went on strike uh, not last night, but the night before. And uh, there were reports that uh, GM knew this was coming, so they were stashing essentially their high-margin vehicles all around the country. They had a lot of inventory preparing for this. And in that, <clears throat> that book, Wrecked, they talked about how the, the entire supply chain for GM and, and Ford and, and Chrysler at the time was uh, changed so that it would not rely or did not empower workers to go on strike very easily. And if you stockpile inventory, you stockpile parts, you stockpile, et cetera, et cetera, you are less subjected to the power of the labor. And uh, much of this is about GM hiring temporary workers. I believe they're called scabs. Well, no, no, no. This Scabs would be people who are crossing a picket line. But I'm talking about in the course of their doing business. Um. There are uh, workers who are full-time workers working across the conveyor belt or whatever it is, the... Um, who are doing the exact same thing they're doing, except for they are there as temporary workers so that GM can pay them less, provide them less benefits, diminish the power of labor, right? Because if you have somebody there who's temporary in terms of status, they, the, the cost of them involved in any type of labor action is less. And... This Reuters says U.S. Automaker, uh, automakers use temporary employees who are paid less and receive uh, fewer benefits to be more cost competitive versus their Asian and European counterparts with non-unionized plants in the U.S. South. And um, the fact is, I, I just don't believe this. I mean, just based upon that, uh, that book that I think part of it is they want to also diminish the power of the full-time workers, the non-temporary workers, and their ability also to increase their wages. So this isn't just a question of we save money on the temporary workers. It is we use the temporary workers to undercut the power of all our workers. Yeah, that's interesting because another thing that they're mad about is um, a two-tier contract. So workers who are not temporary are still paid less than the senior workers who might even do the exact same job. And this is a, a kind of contract that is obviously terrible for worker solidarity. And it's one that the union accepted. Indeed. Um, now, one of the other issues for these workers is that back in 2009, um, the unions really took a hit in helping salvage this company, particularly GM, but others. Um, they allowed for lapsed payments in retirement funds and in healthcare funds, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, here is a, um, a clip of uh, some workers uh, speaking out on CNN. Is it that you all want? Hey, how you doing? Hey, great to see you. What, what do you want? Can you encapsulate it in a couple of sentences of why you're striking? Yeah, just improvements on wages, health care benefits, and profit sharing across the board. A lot of things that we sacrificed back during the recession in 2007, 2008, we want to be compensated for it now as the company is making record-breaking profits. And so, Ray, you also, as I understand it, are a single dad. And so... What time did you show yes. up? What time did you have to show up today to strike? Um, 6 a.m. Okay. And so tell me the effect that this is having on your home and your life. Um, well, being a father, the health care benefits are tremendously important, and trying to survive off of a reduced income is very difficult. So going back to work and with a fair wage is very important for all of us, you know, company-wide. As we understand it, this is just this morning, there are still dozens of sticking points. How does that make you both feel? Yeah. Um, for me personally, I understand the, the difficulty of, of the negotiations and the importance of them. So 
this being a lengthy strike, I'm fine with that being the case as long as everything is ironed out and it's fair for everyone. Because I understand the position of the company as well, trying to go forward and being profitable and being on the cutting edge of new technology and being the leader across the board with uh, the auto industry. But also on the backside of that, the workers who sacrifice for the company to get ahead today and be profitable as it is today, we want to be compensated as well because we took a major sacrifice over the years. I mean, they have. Uh, they've taken a massive and they uh, consider sacrifice. the company's well-being. Indeed. <laughs> Even as the company screws them, them over in every way. Yes. Yeah. Well, they still need the company for jobs. Yes. Of course. But it's a mentality difference that's the, quite striking. Like car. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I've because of uh of my um my in-laws former in-laws uh and their families um i knew quite a few of those folks who had worked for uh ford and gm and this and that and the pride that they take in their work is pretty uh intense in that uh it's not um i think folks work with you know in in constructing things like that, uh, that tends to be a very high level of pride that you don't see necessarily and when you go into like, I work for an accounting firm or something like that. Yeah, they're making things. It's productive, it's literally productive labor. Um, and they so, did a hard picket, by the way. Like you saw some people walking around in the background of that video, just doing what you might normally think of as a picket line, but they also did a hard picket where they physically blocked people from getting into the building, which is how picket lines started. And I think that's pretty cool. We haven't seen that in a while. Um, I have a feeling we're going to see more of it as we go. <clears throat> in the meantime, uh, if you're busy, if you're walking a picket line, for that matter, why not walk a picket line? If you're at, by, by all means, go out and walk a picket line. With, uh, with You will be uh, more than welcomed. And what better thing to do while you're walking a picket line is also then you could literally like read a nonfiction book. How? Blinkist. It's an app that compiles the key t- takeaways from thousands of nonfiction books. Everything you need to know is condensed down to 15 minutes. You can either read it or you can listen to it. Both on the app. Blinkist is, is super unique. It works on your phone. It works on your tablet. It works on your computer, of course. You'll find everything from like health, uh, health books, how-to books, some history books. Um, Elizabeth Colbert's The Sixth Extinction's on there. And... Now that I'm done with my uh, Civil War uh, podcast, I'm all over that. Tried to get her on for the, on the show for that. We couldn't get her on for whatever reason a long time ago. But uh, the Sixth Extinction, um, of course, I've, I talk about uh, that Tim Ferriss four-hour work week, which I listened to. But I also saw the 80-20 principle, which Tim Ferriss first introduced me to. There's a whole book on it. I'm striking and listening to Tim Ferriss. And it's 16 Minutes. It'll take for you to, uh, to listen to it also. And I may go back. I haven't, it was probably, I don't know how many years ago it was that I read a brief history of time. Well, you have 21 minutes. You get to all the, the key takeaways on it. I have all the time. All the time would be yours. With Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books. All the books you want all for one low price and right now Blinkist has a special offer for Majority Report listeners go to Blinkist.com slash majority try it for free for 70 days and save 25% off your new subscription that's Blinkist B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash majority start your 7 day free trial look at this look at some more of they have getting things done the power of habits Factfulness, 10 reasons why we're wrong about the world. Yeah, why things are better than you think. Fire and fury, all that. Check it out, Blinkist.com slash majority. All right, going to take a quick break. When we come back, Bashkar Sankara on his book, The Socialist Manifesto, The Case for Radical Politics in an Era of Extreme Inequality. Be right back.
Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program the editor of Jacobin Magazine, author of The Socialist Manifesto, The Case for Radical Politics in an Era of Extreme Inequality, Bashkar Sankara. Welcome to the back to the program. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, thank you for having me on, and, and I hope everything's going well on your end. Things are going uh, fairly well here, uh, all things considered, um, and uh, so I appreciate it. Sorry, we couldn't get you into studio. I, I have a feeling you're probably calling from around the corner, but um, yeah, yeah, no, I'm in. I'm actually in D.C. today, so it, uh, so it makes sense. But I'm normally, I'm normally either in my apartment or my office in New York, which is you know, the only two places where people can find me. All right. Well, I understand that dynamic very much, actually. Um, but uh, uh, so next time. But all right, let's get into this. Um, this is um, it, it. It's 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 a good time to get into it because uh, right now we're uh, looking at what uh, appears to be a, a three-way race um, in the Democratic Party. Um, one of those um, uh, candidates, I would contend, is leaking oil, as they say. And, um, um, you know, uh, that is always a problem. Uh, but uh, there are two other candidates in there that I think it may in, in some uh, to some extent. Um, well, I, I guess let me let me put it this way, who, who represent two um, options for the left. But there is a distinction and we will get uh, to that. But let's start with this. The difference between a democratic socialist and a social democrat. What what are the difference between those two things? So. Okay, well, I, I think I'm going to preempt your question somewhat by, think, by saying that I don't think that Elizabeth Warren, though she is a progressive, is necessarily either. But in my definition, a, a social democrat, or at least what social democracy has become, is about trying to implement doses of socialism within capitalism. It's about creating certain bedrock social safety net programs for people. It's about, in other words, making life less captive to the tyranny of the, the market. So you have universal health care, you have child care, you have all these other demands. I think democratic socialists believe in all those things, but we want to go a little bit further. We also want to question the inequity and in power that we think stem from the workplace and from the fact that capitalists run workplace like dictatorships and this power and this, this wealth that they accumulate in these workplaces bleeds over into our social and political spheres as well. So if I was to do a very forced, very awkward sports analogy since the beginning of football season, I know as good progressives, you know, we, we don't really like the, the NFL, but, you know, social democracy is getting the ball to within field goal range. You know, democratic socialism is scoring a touchdown. It's figuring out how can we actually create a society in which we're not dependent on capitalists to create the goods and services that we then will tax to um, profits that we then would tax to fund our welfare state. So the um, if I understand you, the the um, the problem with allowing um Capitalists, broadly speaking, to um, remain intact is that there is a tendency that they will there they will turn that capital. We will go from a uh, pluto a, a, a um, uh, plutonomy into a plutocracy in some respects. Yeah, that's essentially what it means is that even if they'll agree to our demands today, if we have a large movement and we have a mass strike wave with all these other things going on. What happens 20 years, 30 years down the road? As soon as the opportunity strikes, capitalists are going to find ways to roll back key parts of the welfare state. We saw this in Sweden. You know, we, we've seen this time and time again that we, when we try to administer these, these reforms, but we don't challenge this control and this power that capital has, they'll find ways to roll back the, the welfare state. So I think for now, we should all be united, uh, those of us left of center, in fighting for the really important demands that will help people day to day, Medicare for all, decent jobs for all, child care, making sure our children have access to nutrition, housing, all these things are things we can, we can agree on. But I think fundamentally the way we go about fighting for these things is either going to be in a way that's confrontational, that recognizes that even though in the short term we're going to have to make compromises, we ultimately are going up against an enemy that, that doesn't want to compromise with us, and as soon as they got the upper hand, they'll, they'll undermine us. Um, or we'll, we'll do it in a kind of technocratic, piecemeal 
mode that doesn't really recognize that that we're in uh, you know, battle to the to the death as far as our, our enemies are, are are concerned. So as Bernie sometimes likes to put it, you know, there has been class war uh, for the last 30, 40 years in this country in a really vicious, vicious way. The only thing, it's been a one-sided class war. What we're proposing is that working people have distinct interests from the interests of our bosses, and we need to figure out a way to organize and fight for things together. I mean, to a certain, it does. Um, I mean, you you you, you cite uh, Sweden uh, in the book as as an example of of, of sort of these reversals, um, um, and 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 go through the history of of different, I guess you call socialist projects. Would you say that um, that turn that that did take place in the maybe let's call it just peg it to the seventies? Uh, in this country, after you know what people call the Great Compression, was uh, in part, a good illustration of of what happens when you don't fundamentally undermine capitalism or capitalists within society in terms of like maintaining um, the you know to the extent that it was not necessarily uh, mm-hmm. shared broadly. Uh, because huge sectors of our society were denied this, but to the extent that it existed, that um, the 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 sort of the uh, worker benefits and, and middle class, uh, mm-hmm. what they enjoyed was was then basically slowly taken away. Yeah, I think a lot of what we got in the 40s, 50s, 60s, this was just the result of an environment in which there was kind of a growth liberalism. So the economy is growing so fast that capital didn't want any disruptions. So they could break off pieces of the pie to labor. But as soon as they entered any sort of economic difficulties like they did in the, the 70s and early 80s, then they, they basically were like, well, this arrangement that was working when our, our profit rates were, were this high is no longer uh, working for us anymore. So sometimes when we think about neoliberalism, let's say, we think of it in two ideological terms like the neoliberalism is just this idea that was conjured up in some room by Milton Friedman, a bunch of other odious guys in the Chicago school. But in fact, what neoliberalism is, what the era that we've been living in for the last 20, 30 years, it's just capitalism getting its groove back. It's just, you know, the uh, the reassertion of capital saying we need to be flexible enough to restructure and deregulate and not have to deal with union interference. But this so-called interference is the only thing that was making sure that some of this growth and some of this tremendous wealth in our society was, in fact, trickling down to, to working people. So in the short term, a lot of what we, we need to do is not just support one presidential candidate or not just support one issue demand like Medicare for All in isolation, but to connect these things with a broader struggle to repoliticize our civil society, to get to the point where you could talk to your, your friends, your neighbors, your family about politics, get to the point where we have big union drives in this country, get to the point where we have civic assemblies, uh, you know, things like Occupy, but more per- permanent, where we could really think of ourselves as not just passive consumers, but producers and political agents and citizens. And I think in a small part, this is some of the promise of the Sanders campaign. You know, not all of it is realized, but at least it gets people to thinking about politics and thinking that, you know, all these things happening in my life that I think of as individual failings, that I think of as just kind of calamities that I'm suffering from in isolation are in fact related to social problems. And these social problems have collective solutions beyond just individual grit and kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstrap. I, I want to, I want to just to stay for a moment in terms of like, you know, <clears throat> where, um, where, uh, Social Democrats, um, I sort of like where where uh, Democratic socialists uh, and and Social Democrats where they sort of uh, I guess uh, it's not so much that they part ways on a uh, on 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 a highway if you use that metaphor, but uh, one goes further. When when do you cross that threshold? Like like like, like to what extent? Um, um, like at what point do you do? You know, and I know this is pretty theoretical stuff that we're talking about, but at what point does uh, is capital undermined enough so that they don't have the ability to reverse gains that have been made? So let's look historically. I think it's a really, really good question. Um, but let's look historically at at our kind of archetype for social democracy, the country where it was most successful. 
Uh, in Sweden, the Social Democrats emerged as a force in the early 1900s, and initially in the early decades, they were fighting for political democracy because Sweden was quite a vicious, oligarchical, anti-democratic country. And once they win political uh, suffrage and rights for this mass of working people that they're, they're representing, then they begin the construction of social democracy. And they rule virtually uninterrupted from the 1930s until the mid to late 1970s, until 1976. And you see that in the first 40s, uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s, this is times of consolidation of you know, Swedish capital growing, but a lot of this, this wealth coming down to workers. You see the beginnings of the construction of a welfare state to the point that at least your core necessities of life, you were no longer dependent on the market, even though it was fundamentally driven by a capitalist market economy. And these, these social goods were dependent on taxation from capital. And what people on the far left, what Leninists thought looking at social democracy was that, well, obviously they could see some of the good in it. They could see that people's lives were getting better. But one of their main criticisms was, well, essentially you're buying off workers. You are taking workers, you're making them you know, live a cushier life, but you're tying them real close to the success of their firms and also to the state. And they thought this would be conservatizing. But in fact, what we discovered in the history of social democracy, or at least in the Swedish case, was that winning more demands didn't make people more complacent. It caused them to demand more. And uh, you know, a simple illustration of this is just the fact, let's say both me and you, Sam, are, are um, unemployed, and I'm unemployed in an area with 20% local unemployment, and you're unemployed in an area with virtually full employment, you know, 2 3% unemployment. Who's going to be... Um, um, uh, sorry, sir. let's say you're employed in that environment, who's going to be more apt to go to their boss and to demand a raise or to potentially get together with your colleagues and risk going on strike? Obviously, it's going to be the person in the environment with lower unemployment. In the same way, in Sweden, workers had gotten so much rights, they've gotten so much security from this welfare state, that by the late 60s, by 1967, 1968, you see mass strike waves across Sweden, but strikes that are demanding not just better wages and conditions, but strikes that are demanding industrial democracy. They start, in other words, to question the right of management to manage. And this is really uh, kind of a fundamental step in the direction of democratic socialism in questioning not just redistributive outcomes, but questioning the very game um, itself. And Throughout the 1970s, as Swedish capital descends into crisis because of a variety of, of reasons, this worldwide slump that happened in a lot of Western countries, Swedish capitalists, who before in the 1950s and 60s could say, well, listen, I'm getting less money, I'm high, taxed more, I'm regulated more, I have to deal with powerful unions compared to my, my fellow capitalists in, say, France or Britain, but unlike them, I have industrial peace. You know, the workers are happy enough that they're not going on strike, so at least whatever returns I'm getting is predictable returns. Now we're saying, well, I have to deal with a restless workforce, and my profitability is down, and I have to deal with all these international stuff going on, like the globalization of the economy, like the OPEC shock, and, and so on. And then they say, well, this arrangement that's working for us is no longer working. And they have this ability to withhold investment. So sometimes when we think about the power of capital, we think in really dramatic terms. We think about the coup of Allende in Chile in 1973. We think about even capital flight, you know, ca capitalists just leaving whole locations. But the way the capitalists more often than not exert their power on even center-left governments, even very good progressive governments, is by saying we are no longer going to invest unless you make the so-called business environment more favorable, which means, in other words, unless you do, let us do what we want to do. And fundamentally, there was a few different responses to this. On the right wing of social democracy, the third way social democrats that later became call, called people like Schroeder and Gordon Brown, and you know he was always worse than the rest of them, but Tony Blair, you could throw in this, this you know, group of people too, their gambit was, we're going to let capital do what it wants. We're going to let capital deregulate. We're going to weaken the unions, weaken our very social base that gets us elected. But in return, in this environment of renewed growth, 
we're going to tax this renewed growth, and we're going to use this taxation money to fund the key parts of our welfare state. We're going to keep the NHS. We're going to keep you know, all these other kind of key parts of the welfare state provisioning. That was the gamble of, of third wave social democracy. We're going to retreat you know, down you know, maybe 50 steps, but we're going to make sure that we don't treat, retreat all the way to the bottom. And that's the only way we'll preserve some, some gains that we have, we have made in the past. On the left wing of social democracy, though, we said, well, maybe there's a way, instead of retreating down those 50 steps, where we could charge up to the, to the roof of the system. And the charge was, was done, you know, proposed in, in its most ambitious form um, by something called the MITRE plan, which would have slowly over time transferred ownership of Swedish companies uh, to the people who work there, to the workers. Because workers don't flee there's no capital flight from your own community. If your job and your ownership is tied with your community, um, work, uh, worker controlled, or in this case, a, a, a workplace controlled by, by these collective funds wouldn't just refuse to, right. to invest. You know, they would have a very different set of incentives. Well, they're, they're literally they already support. invested in that community. I mean, the, by, by exactly, virtue exactly. that they, they don't have the ability, um, they don't have access to the means of which, you know, to find another one, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and the, by the way, in this kind of firm, your mentality would also completely change, too, because your goal is not to maximize your total profits, but you're rather maximize your profit for worker. So some of the imperatives of, of capitalism, the imperative of, of having to, uh, you know, constantly expand its scale in the same way just to accumulate this vast amount of, of profits that's not reinvested into communities but rather hoarded by a few people. You know, these dynamics change. I mean, in my vision of a social society, there's still a market economy in a certain sphere and firms still compete and, you know, inefficient firms go away. But there's also a difference between, you know, have, being in an inefficient firm that's outcompeted and landing on a cushy welfare state and getting retrained and going to another sector than what happens today, which is, you know, you uh, get laid off of your job and you have unemployment benefits for a few weeks and they make you feel degraded. They make you feel terrible when you're taking it. And, you know, then your unemployment benefits and your COPA is up and you're, you know, out of luck, right? So, um, in other words, so with social democracy, there were alternatives. The right wing kind of solution to the crisis of social democracy was perceived was pursued, but uh, in my view, there was always a left wing alternative, and you saw it being attempted in fits and starts. But our premise is this: we go to what we know works. We know that social democracy works. From there, we have an inkling about some of the pressures, some of the contradictions of social democracy that we'll run into. Uh, then from there, we need to go beyond social democracy. But day to day, this is kind of in the future. But day to day. The main difference between a social democrat and a democratic socialist is, to some degree, how do you want to fight for these, these things that we, we both agree that we need in our society? Do we fight for universal health care by sitting down at the table and making a compromise with key business leaders and the health insurance companies and whatnot? Do we fight through class struggle, through a march on Washington, through all these other kind of methods? And to me, even though someone like Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, you could even say, has a program, a set of demands that's fundamentally social democratic, they're going about fighting for these demands through class struggle. And that's a key distinction for me. You know, I don't care what you call yourself. You call yourself progressive, you call yourself a democratic socialist, a social democrat or whatever. If you're willing to struggle with working people and take on the powerful interests that are keeping us down, then, then you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. That's the most important thing. And and so okay and so um, as we the 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 idea is that that mode of of operation is going to set you up to um, diminish capital's power so that they don't have the ability in leaner times to essentially um, take it out of uh, to to externalize those costs onto workers essentially. Um, and to, to rest in mm -hmm. society. 
I mean, yes, exactly. Yeah. And and so, yeah, so, so well, so I mean, so do you have a sense? I mean, as you go uh, forward, in you know, if that other path had been taken, let's say, and 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 presumably um, that uh, that other path was not pursued because of the political power of capital uh, that that they they have as a function of of having the capital. Um, and so do you have a sense, and, and maybe again, uh, I guess it was still like, w- at what point, how much gets you to a point of equilibrium? Cause I, I guess when I mm-hmm. contemplate, I mean, I, I guess I am of just sort of, um, philosophically speaking, sort of convinced that, that, that a certain amount of tension is always necessary, right. Uh, to just maintain, uh, some measure of of tension, and um, is there a a concern that like you? I mean, is there an idea, even a theoretical um, uh, concept of like if forty percent of uh, of businesses or certain industries are essentially worker owned? Um, then, um, you know, you've, you've, you've achieved a, uh, you've crossed a threshold mm-hmm. where capital simply doesn't yeah, have the power yeah. to. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Is there kind of a tipping point here yes. where we are in a different sort of society? Well, I would say that the kind of changes that we need to implement would be gradual, but sectoral. So in other words, um, all right, let's talk about at the beginning, it'll be decommodifying key parts of the economy. So we could imagine, indeed, you know, we both are kind of fighting for in the next five years, decommodifying the healthcare okay, sector. Right. So in this case, it's a gradual reform in the context of the whole economy, though within the sector of the health insurance business, it's, it's quite you know, drastic. Of course, there'll be a just transition for the working people that are in this sector trying to support their, themselves and their families, but, but it'll be kind of a, a big change in that sector. And we can imagine that applying to other of these key sectors that we don't think should be dependent on your ability to pay, that we don't think the market has a big role, should have a role in. There, there are certain you know, things that, that are in any, even a, you know, a capitalist economist would admit, you know, these are natural monopolies. There's, there's no need for, for competition. In fact, the state should just as well you know, take it over. So... Um, you know, I think that's that's a key. Um, what are those sectors? That when it comes- like, I mean, if you were to like well, tick I, them uh, off, I mean, I imagine that you have your your secret uh, list of sectors that you're going to uh, going to uh, take over one at a time. What what well, after well, healthcare? Well, what I comes- think I think that things like having um, our our transport sector, like when it comes to our national rail lines right. and and things like that, being actually run by the government. You know, right now. You have a little bit of government ownership in some of the Northeast, if you know, via kind of a, in a complicated relationship with with uh, um, Amtrak's a very confusing organization. But you, you have some level of state direction and control and investment and execution. In um, you know other other parts of the country, you absolutely do not. If anyone's ever been on the West Coast, sitting and waiting behind a fracking truck and sitting in an Amtrak, which which has to sit sit for like two hours while like you know, cargo uh, passes by, you know, you would, um, you would know what I mean. Um, other sectors, like obviously healthcare is one that I mentioned, telecommunications, you know, there's certain sectors like that, that I think the state can probably do a better job at than even worker-owned uh, firms. When it comes to other worker-owned firms, the way this legislation, I think, should be implemented would be saying, and there's proposals in this direction, they're not as ambitious in the UK right now, that firms over a certain size to begin with, let's say firms employing 50 or more people, must give kind of buybacks of equity every single year to a collective fund owned by that firm's um, employees. And over time, for instance, in 10, 20, 30 years, um, a majority of the controlling interest and therefore a majority of these boards would be run by, by workers. So... You know, some capitalists will go along with it to say, well, I'm still making plenty of money because essentially I'm being bought out 
by right. my my employees. Uh, there's others that'll you know resist like like hell, but but that's that's what I imagine the the situation being. I don't think that we could just keep the existing structure of society without legislation and just create co-ops uh, and kind of seize uh, of capitalism. I think we need to be pushed by by legislation and by a strong labor movement, and it's some ways out. Uh, you know, but let's consider what, what we're talking about, a horizon and a vision of a society without class, without this distinction between management and employee and, and, and ownership that I think, as a socialist, I believe I'm normatively, normatively opposed to. You know, I, I, I believe that if we have a, an alternative to these extreme forms of hierarchy, that we should pursue these alternatives. And pursuing this alternative has the added benefit of securing the welfare state that I believe already in a majority of Americans think is, you know, their right as human beings, the right to a decent job, the right to health care, the right to a roof over their, their head. So, but as we're fighting for these things, I think we need to make clear that we're not just trying to convince people of a good vision or good argument. We are running up against people who have a vested interest in the status quo. Because there's a lot of people getting rich uh, due to the fact that there's no uh, rent controls and there's no we're not building public housing stock to to decrease the house of, of uh, the you know price of, of private housing stock. There's a lot of people getting rich off real estate speculation. There's a hell of a lot of people getting rich off the way that our health insurance system is is run. And for the longest time in the Democratic Party, at best, candidates have been talking in technocratic terms about how to help, you know, middle class and families, as, as they put it. Uh, but they haven't been talking about the vested interest and the power structure against us. And it's not something that we could just wish away. So, so I think that's a real utility in being democratic socialist today. It's not necessarily advocating a different set of return, reforms in the short term. It's advocating a different means of going about and achieving these things. Right. So uh, first order are these material benefits, but the second order is uh, making sure that they're sustainable. And that requires a, a structural change. Um, and, and Yeah, and they're, they're connected. Right. Yeah. If you can't get, get Medicare for all, then you're not going to be able to get, uh, you're not going to have the power to demand something like uh, more employee control of, of, of their workplaces. You know, they're, right. they're, they're very much connected. Winning well, begets winning. Many people, I think, have, have theorized that's basically what happened in the late 60s and 70s. At one point, like uh, there was, at least within the context of, uh, of you know, white society, um, people felt confident enough in their economic futures that they started to um uh you know uh, i guess demand more uh, uh political power and that became somewhat problematic uh for the powers that be um and all right so um and, and let me just a uh, uh to 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 channel um uh Jamie here um uh, Jamie i suspect would would have issue with the idea of 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 markets uh, continuing uh, in that you know workers competing uh, in in their firms against each other uh, could lead to their their own exploitation and sort of like more you know uh, we've got to we've got to hit these numbers everybody uh, we're you know and the uh, the workers council has voted that we're all going to be here and we're going to be doing ten hours a day because mm -hmm. we got to hit these numbers I mean what what. What's your response? Well, to well I think like the, way, the way you you solve that problem is through you know fair and just state regulations to, towards setting maximum work days, towards setting certain standards and certain that that workplaces must operate within uh, to create a competitive and fair um, environment. Um, I think that's that's incredibly uh, you know necessary. Um, but you know fundamentally, I just cannot imagine. If we agree that we're still in a condition of relative scarcity, which might change in the future, you know, I can't imagine a society producing efficiently um, without having uh, some degree of firm failure, without pushing ourselves to um, innovate and to be a little bit different. And in fact, if you have a centrally planned system, if you have a system that's less efficient, what you might end up with is workers producing less efficiently in more labor-intensive ways. 
why wouldn't we want a firm that is so inefficient that they're not making the right technological investments that they're forced to work 12, 13 hours in order to stay competitive with, with firms that are, that are doing things in different ways? Why would we want that latter firm to stick around? If the penalties for losing and the penalties for the people at that firm is, once again, bouncing off this cushy kind of safety net of a welfare state. So, so what's key for, to me is that socialism must represent both voice and exit for working people. So voice within your workplace, but also the ability to leave work. And so enough of society has to be outside the market. But you know, in order to, to, to actually keep that decommodified sector of the society well-funded and humming, I do think you need some sort of productive sphere. But, but for me, markets have existed before, uh, capitalism, right. and they'll probably exist for a long time after after capitalism. My problem is not necessarily the markets themselves. My problem is how the firms that are competing within the market are structured, which is in a, as, tyr- as tyrannical kind of firms under capitalism, and also what the penalties for failure is. Whereas right now it's it's destitution, and and that's not a reasonable penalty. But for consumer goods, you know, I see no reason why there should be a state monopoly off the, oh, oh, you know, on the production of you know forks and knives. I think that'll bring back a lot of bad memories for people of the inefficiency and failures of, of plant economies in the 20th century. Um, I'm satisfied with that. You can go on to the antifada and maybe we continue the. the, the <laughs> but but right, so let me ask. I would you, love to have you. So okay, but let me. <laughs> So, um, all right. So let's pivot a little bit to the sort of the um, the 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 current day political pitch on some level. And um, like, what do you do in terms of is it, is the project right now, from your perspective, to raise? Con- and I should say that you know, I um, I. I you know, uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm very comfortable going down this road, and um, I'm quite convinced that I'm not uh, I'm going to be leaving this planet before it gets anywhere where I don't feel comfortable where it is. So I'm happy to travel down that road as far as as far as I I still have the uh, capacity to walk. So, but um, but in the context of of your project, like what is the challenge now in terms of 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 raising awareness and so uh, like, like to what extent i mean because theoretically right i mean on mm-hmm. some level uh bernie sanders should be uh polling higher on some level if this is if if or or, or, or why isn't he let's put it that way well i think there's a variety of reasons one of which is that most Democrats like all the Democratic nominees. You know, people like me and you have very strong uh, favorites, right? You know, we, uh, we you know, feel very strongly about the candidates. A lot of people are just, well, they really hate Trump. And a lot of the candidates are, are broadly saying the right things about, about social goods. And, you know, loyal Democrats just want Trump, Trump out of there. Right. So I think, you know, that explains why it's kind of a dead heat for these top three candidates. And Biden's the most familiar, the most connected with the very popular Obama. So, you know, he's, he's a little bit ahead. But, but I think we could explain that pretty easily. I think the broader problem, the broader question of what's happening on the left, what's happening with, with uh, you know, democratic socialism is that we're resuscitating right now, but we're coming alive as largely a media phenomenon. Don't get me wrong. There's tens of thousands of, of working people that are democratic socialists now that are doing great work organizing their communities, but we don't yet have the mass base of millions that we need to change this country. And, and that's a big challenge. How do we get more implanted and more rooted in working communities? A lot of people who are democratic socialists today are, um, you know, college educated people. A lot of them are declassed professionals that, that you know, from, were from parents were accountants and lawyers and now we're working working class jobs for sure. But we are definitely drawn from a particular milieu. And and in order to become a broader, more diverse, more more rooted movement, we really need to win over um, layers of working people. And the way to do that is obviously just patient and slow organizing. There's great work being done right now in Brooklyn by DSA connected to the Crown Heights Tenants Union, connected with these fights in New York around 
uh, rent controls. Uh, there's great work being done around the country in these, these congressional races, which is a reason to, for, for people just to knock on doors and to talk about your ideas and talk about politics. So there's a lot of really exciting things going on, and we just need to keep double downing on these efforts. I think we do need to be connected to, to Bernie 2020 and to, to, to some of the movement around Bernie Sanders and the fight for Medicare for all and so on. And all these campaigns are a way just to deepen our, our base, but we can't be content with just being a high-profile um, you know, group because our, our strength needs to come from being really deeply rooted in the communities that can really disrupt and threaten capital and can force the, the reforms that we desperately need in this country. I I, I tend to think that, like, you know, uh, it, it's very possible to get sort of too clever about um, uh, sort of strategizing certain things. But but as you lay out your, your vision, right, like there are basically um, – uh, Getting some type of universality and uh, decommodifying healthcare begins to give uh, you the power to uh, decommodify other area sectors of of our economy, and then you know it, it it sort of snowballs, and then you're able to sort of move into uh, democratizing um, uh, some of these uh, other sectors and 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 firms, as you say. So there is like a sequencing. Is are you concerned at all that um, the sequence is not quite there yet to support a political victory by someone who will attempt to do a lot of these things? In other words, like, is there, um, it, it, you know, in, you know, when I wake up at three in the morning, uh, which happens far too often and can't get back to sleep, like the idea of like, OK, uh, Bernie wins. The economy uh, goes south because it's uh, been uh, juiced and um, there is a massive pushback uh, because Democrats, obviously Republicans, but even a significant number of Democrats don't want to see these type of reforms. They they're, they're still uh, too much entrenched power. And um, it. It, it, it begins to cut away at the progress that's just made in terms of society because uh, Bernie ends up being, you know, sort of like stranded on some level uh, because mm-hmm. there's not quite the, the support for amongst the population that needs to be there to actually enact these type of reforms. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what we need to do right away is if we have a presidency of someone like a Bernie Sanders and we use the bully pulpit of the presidency, we use executive orders to show people that we're fighting for them. Uh, then certainly there will be other parts of our legislative agenda that we want to push through and we're unable to because of Congress and because the markets are getting riled up and whatever else. But we need to place the blame where where it should be blamed. You know, we need to say that, you know, we're in a fight against these interests and these interests are trying to undermine our program. You know, if you, in a weird way, I, I think that, you know, there's lessons from the Trump administration. Trump has not delivered to his supporters most of what his supporters wanted. And, and thank God for that. But he has been able to do certain things to use a bully pulpit of the presidency to support this really nasty right-wing populist movement that, that's getting up. And, and I think we need to um, use the bully pulpit of executive office to support the real activism on the streets that will give us more space and more leverage to demand certain things. And probably the best historical example I could give is the example of the 1930s in France. So Leon Blum, the first president um, back then, uh, prime minister, back then had prime ministers of, of France, uh, who was a socialist, was also uh, a Jew, and he was beaten up about uh, one, two months before he took office and dragged you know, from a car, beaten up by an anti-Semitic gang. He knew how dangerous the threat of fascism was. But when he took power, he didn't think he could actually administer or do much to advance his vision of socialism. What he thought he was doing was, in his words, occupying power. And the act of occupying power for him was just, I'm going to sit in the seat so the right cannot sit in the seat. Because if the right sits in the seat, they're going to make it harder to advance our agenda and get the things I want two, three, you know, four um, you know, years or decades down the road. But instead, what we ended up with was a situation where workers themselves started going on strike, started doing all this disruption to the point that capital was forced to, to compromise. And Liam Blum was able to get things enacted that, that summer, like the start of summer holidays and all these other demands. So I think that's the example we have to look for. It's not just what 
the power of, of capital. It's how can we summon a countervailing uh, force on the on the streets? To what extent? I mean, wh- where does race fit into to all of this? Um, because um, uh, you know, one of the things that um, one of my catchphrases around here now is uh, it's been for a while that, that you know, to a certain extent, um, there is a zero sum. Um, there is a there is a zero sum reality in terms of um, of of white people, white males uh, losing some of their uh, status within society. Not just economic, although that's certainly part of it. But when we look at like, you know, your 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 average Trump voter, um, they're not particularly uh, I mean, they're not uh, particularly suffering economically. You, you know, obviously, the um, the votes who uh, folks who voted against uh, Trump, um, you know, uh, on average, um, making less money, struggling just as much. But there is um, a a real sense of loss by white males that they are no yeah, longer yeah, centered in our society. How do you, wh- wh- how does that fit in with um, your perspective? So, so I actually do have to go on about five minutes. Because okay. I'm just getting signals that sure. I, I completely have no idea G- DC geography. And apparently I'm way further from Union Station than I thought. But I think the key thing is to stress to people that, that we are in fact demanding a program that will help everyone, but will particularly help those who are most oppressed, will particularly help women, will particularly help, help people of color, will particularly help in this country black Americans who suffer the most from not having a decent welfare state, from being deprived opportunities and jobs and, and so on, but that this gain doesn't come at your expense. So we need to stress the idea that any privilege that a working class person has, say a white male working class person has over other working people, is a relative and not an absolute privilege. And that's, that's really uh, key to stress. And we need to create an environment where we're not just telling people to compare and weigh their privileges. But we're saying, listen, we all need to go together and we need to fight together and we need to make advances together. Um, I hope that works. All right. Well, but I also case, I also hope you, you make your train too. Uh Bashkar Sankara, we will we will, we will do this again. Thanks so much. I appreciate All your right, time. Bye. All right, bye-bye. All right, well, folks, we'll put uh, obviously a link uh, to the book. Uh, I think we've done that uh, in the past and 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 we'll have Bashkar on cuz uh, I think we still had a lot of stuff left on the table. Um but uh interesting interesting in light of uh what we're looking at in terms of like the um the what's happening in the uh, democratic uh, primary at this point one thing people might also not know about the book is it's called a manifesto but there's a lot of history in there too a lot of history yeah. it recounts all the near misses for <laughs> for the uh, for a socialist revolution uh, we didn't even get to the the part of 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 uh, bashkar's conception of uh, what a revolution looks like. Yeah, that's... a lot less, a um, lot less violent than I think uh, the the um, uh, people sometimes associate with. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask him about. Um, we, I had it down there. We just didn't. We'll to, we'll have him back on. To be continued. To be continued. Um, and we should say also, you know, uh, the uh, Elizabeth Warren. Well, we'll we'll talk about the WFP in um, in the uh, the fun half of the program. I mean, I think um, there's uh, the WFP endorsed um, Elizabeth Warren. She had a big uh, rally in New York City yesterday, twenty thousand people, uh, decent showing, uh, uh, and. Um, we will get to that as well. Uh, we'll also have a couple of clips from Ben Shapiro in the fun half. Oh, it's going to be so fun. Uh, folks, just a reminder, this program relies on your support. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. And when you do, you not only get the show a commercial free, but you also get extra content virtually every single day. I think, you know, let's just call it every day. I mean, obviously not on uh, the weekends. And maybe there's one or two days where it doesn't happen for the most part. Uh, New content, extra content every day. Uh, Don't forget also the AM Quickie. It is available in the Majority Report audio feed. Soon to uh, live on its own 
on its own feed and just coffee.coop fair trade coffee tea or chocolate use the coupon code majority get 10 percent off and a reminder this episode brought to you by blinkist the blinkist app takes the key takeaways from thousands of best-selling non-fiction books and condenses them down into just 15 minutes that you can either read or listen to 10 million people are using blinkist right now but the beauty is 12 million could be using it and you're still going to enjoy it the exact same way. It's the it's an infinite resource. It has massive and growing library from self-help to business uh, to health and history books. Right now you can get 25% off your first year at Blinkist.com slash majority. Check it out. Today is Tuesday. Michael. Yes, sir. Something's going to happen in the studio tonight. Seven o'clock. Actually, first I should say Six o'clock pre-stream uh, with uh, a, a really good Canadian YouTuber, Chris Aviosis, on Canada's elections and the possibility of a North American hemispheric left. But on the main show, uh, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the Israeli elections. What's really driving possible conflict between Iran, Saudi, the Houthis, and what the U.S. role actually is in that, how Trump is sort of an outsized continuation of what already exists, even as he sells Patriot missiles to Bahrain. Emma Viglin is coming through, and we are going to dunk on and and turn Joe Biden into a wounded antelope, as well as talking about U.K. elections and the WFP. Patreon.com slash TMBS, Michael Brooks Show on YouTube, and grab your tickets to see us in Philly. Jamie. So this week on the Antifada, we were going to run our interview with Aaron Bastani about his book, Fully Automated Luxury Communism. But that has been preempted and moved to next week because of the UAW strike. Um, Sean and Andy dropped an emergency episode last night. Surprise, surprise up, just like Beyonce. And uh it's really good. I just listened to it. Sean knows so much about labor history. So if you really want to understand what's going on with the UAW strike right now in its proper historical context, uh, check it out. It's free for everyone. Uh, Patreon.com slash The Antifada. Matt. Uh, yeah, Literary Hangover, uh, James Fenimore Cooper's The Pioneers. It's a really interesting book about how... Uh, the the biggest actually most land was settled from native americans after the revolution than before it um so yeah people might be surprised to learn that i was all right quick break fun half left is best Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber-jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. 
Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Uh, um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. I, that, that, that thing, I, I, that, the Academy Award. I mean, I've probably watched that thing now probably at least a hundred times, right? And I, 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 every it's time, high art. still, I see things that I hadn't seen before. I, can, can we like arrange some type of interview with, I, I mean, just for my own personal edification with the, with the guy who made that? Because I'm just curious as like, what, what came first? I'm going to say the image in his head or her, I'm sorry, her, my bad. And then the song and then the video to flesh out these beautiful images for everyone. I, I, I I'm, I'm really curious about that. Did she have the story first? Like, well, I, I'll I, reach don't, out. I don't understand how that, I'm going to say yes. That story existed in her mindscape. Um, Now, as you know, we reported the other day uh, that the man who Donald Trump referred to as my African-American has decided to leave the Republican Party uh, because he came to the conclusion that Donald Trump may actually not be a friend of of people who are black or guys brown. stole all the tvs um apparently it was when he told the members of the squad to go back where they came from that he suddenly realized like hey wait a second <laughs> i do love these departure points there's always the you even in like those cnn focus groups they'll always be like well, I thought Donald Trump was the greatest political leader in American history. And then, then last I noticed week, he does uh, yeah, Wait tweets. a second. It's like he's a racist. Like he said, you can't say that on Twitter. Right. Very strange. But, but, good news coming from the Trump camp. For every African-American he loses, he's convinced that he's got a Hispanic. And another great friend of mine, somebody that was on... CNN, and they didn't like him because he was too positive on Trump. Can you believe it? He happens to be Hispanic. He happens to be Hispanic, but I've never quite figured it out because he looks more like a wasp than I do. So I haven't figured that one out. But I'll tell you what, there is nobody that loves this country more or Hispanic more than Steve Cortez. Steve. He loves Hispanic. Thank you. Nobody Steve. loves Hispanic more. Nobody loves the Hispanics more. What do you like more, the country or the Hispanics? He says the country. I don't know. I, I, I may have to go for the Hispanics, to be honest with you. We got. I, I mean, first off, I think we know why Steve Cortez and he get along so well because he doesn't look Hispanic. So I'm not reminded by it. I'm learning so much about the construction of whiteness, it, folks. It's literally like he left the White House to go uh, to the Santa Ana Star Center in uh, Rio Rancho, New Mexico, to give a talk. And they said, listen, we just got this polling back. Not doing well with Hispanics. What about Don't take, worry. I'll take care of it. I take care of it. I like Hispanic. I was talking to one the other day. Hey, everybody. I, hey, hey, hey. Check this like out. It. Ready for the pose to shift? Here's a Hispanic who doesn't look Hispanic <laughs> that I like. That I like. Thank you. And look at Just this. Just wait for the new numbers. Watch this. Do you like America better or Hispanic? 
Oh, you like America? Well, I think I might like Hispanic. I think I might like uh, Hispanic, but uh, I don't know. It's so hard to tell. How many votes am I going to get? I so how many I, votes? I will tell you, though, that I am in touch with members of the Sanders campaign to propose that in a brilliant act of triangulation that while we follow all of our obligations under international law on refugees and decriminalize the border, that we ban uh, Hispanic and Latin American people who have over a half a million dollars in liquid assets from coming into the country completely. Yeah, because like they're bringing they're bringing a lot of problems. Figure out what they have very autocratic on. ideas. <laughs> they are used to owning some feudal of, states, and many of crews. them are involved in drug trafficking. Some of them, I'm sure, are good people. Some of them, I'm sure, <laughs> just happen to be passive recipients of wealth that are good people. Their daughters are doing bad comedy. Their, their daughters are doing embarrassing comedy in the New York Times, oh my God. and they're not disclosing obvious conflicts of interest. There's a lot of problems here. And we need to figure out what the hell's going on. I, Bernie Sanders, <laughs> propose a complete and total ban on light-skinned Hispanics from entering the United States. <laughs> Till oh we figure God. out what the hell is going on. Oh my They've destabilized many great experiments. The Bolivarian Revolution, they're still bitching about Castro. He beat them decades ago. These are very <laughs> bad people. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing money. They're bringing unregulated capitalism. We need to do something about it. And I mean, it, Ted Cruz, need I say more? Yeah, Ted Cruz. Just look at Ted Cruz. When you see Ted Cruz's face, think unrestricted white Hispanic immigration. <laughs> no. Look at all those Joanna Houseman standing behind Trump in that video. Oh, my God. Can we zoom back in on that? Jesus. Let's go to the phones. Call from a 210 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Sam. This is the ghost of Corn Pop from Wilmington. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody yeah. getting in on it. Oh. Get Biden. <laughs> is this John from San Antonio? Yeah. Uh, My God, John. I don't know. You've been uh, calling it to this program for years. I don't think you've ever identified yourself uh, as anything other than John from San Antonio. That's fantastic. I thought we were talking to Corn Pop. Wow. Well, uh, Ghost of Corn Pop, yeah, what do you well, got for us? I was inspired. I was inspired. Uh, so, yeah, the last Emerson uh, release, uh, college poll released today in Delegate Rich. Uh, California has Bernie and Biden tied at 20 per, 20, 26% with Warren at 20. Is also a capital weekly poll from California. So that if you get an average, you got Warren at 27, Bernie and Biden at 22, which is a vast improvement for Bernie and uh, pretty bad for Biden. So uh, in last uh, Thursday night's debate, uh, Warren addressed uh, the issues of family paying less than total, total costs as opposed to journalists who frame the question like Republicans and talk about raising taxes. It, it, so I'm gonna, every time I read a Biden quote, I'm going to read it exactly as he says it. He says, it doesn't cost $30 trillion, $3.4 trillion. It turns out uh, it, it turns out is twice – what the entire federal budget is. So that's completely wrong. The last budget projection that ends at, you know, at the end of the month, revenue is projected to be 3.4 trillion and the budget is a uh, trillion uh, dollars higher. So here's another quote from Biden. That's well, uh, let me just add this before you go. Let me just add, make one thing clear too, that half of that money that he's talking about is already expended by the federal government. Like when we look at that number of $32 trillion over the course of 10 years, what is, um, what is left unsaid is that we're already, we're already spending one and a half trillion dollars per year. I mean, excuse me, over the course of that, uh, that, uh, 10 years on, on healthcare. So the, uh, the, uh, it's, it cost three point two trillion dollars, but not an extra three point two trillion dollars. Go ahead. Right, that's right. Right. So, uh, so that's before exists now without interest on the debt. How are you going to pay for it? I want to hear tonight how that's happened. Uh, later in the conversation, Biden says the tax of two percent that the senator is talking about that raises three billion. Uh, Guess what? That leaves you 28 billion short. 
I really don't really know if Biden's talking about uh, Warren's wealth tax, which is a 2% tax, which is projected to raise $2.75 trillion over 10 years. And that money is not directed to go to the Medicare trust fund, uh, but in the general funds. So, or if he could have confused billions with trillions, uh, Warren's, you know, it doesn't list any changes to our funding mechanism for Bernie's Medicare for All plan, which he supports on our website. So Biden goes on. You're going to to the middle class person, someone making sixty grand with three kids. They're gonna they're gonna pay it in five thousand more. Uh, this is also incorrect. So that person making sixty grand is currently paying one point four five. A percent of their salary are eight hundred and seventy dollars a year, but receive no benefits you know that they put in for Medicare until they retired or become disabled uh, under bernie 's uh, plan, each worker will pay four percent uh, unless they are in poverty in which they won 't pay anything so uh, that's, that's about thirty five hundred bucks po- uh, well. Yeah, I mean it's uh, so it's an increase of 2.55 percent, or an increase of 1,525 dollars a year. Not even close to the 5,000 that Biden says they'll have to pay. So now under Biden's plan, if they opt into the system, they will have to pay 8.5 percent of their salary for that person earning 60,000 a year, uh, which will be about 51. Five thousand one hundred dollars a year, plus deductibles, plus copays, plus they won't receive vision, dental, or audiology. Uh, Medicare for for America coverage is nine point six nine of each employee's salary. The reason Bernie's plan works is because it establishes nine taxes on the ultra wealthy Wall Street and corporations. Now, this has been uh, there's been some skepticism whether that four percent will cover everything to keep the the Medicare trust fund solvent. It may have to be raised to five percent or even six percent, but this is far superior. To any other plan, right. oh, I guess five percent. Then five percent would be about thirty-five hundred bucks, thir- maybe thirty-two hundred bucks uh, for that for sixty thousand. And um, right, you, that's for for all of those health care benefits. Um, it's a great deal. Right. It, yeah, it's exactly three thousand. But yeah. Uh, but yeah. So I mean. So yeah. It's 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 obviously the best best deal. And y'all had some very good commentary during the debate on Thursday. So recently, Bernie has been criticized by many fact checkers by saying Americans are paying twice as much as under other industrialized nations. While this this is true for most for many countries in Europe, you know the Swiss also pay high rates. They pay eight percent of their salaries to an insurance company, though about thirty seven percent receive uh, subsidies. They pay on average seven thousand three hundred and seventeen in total health care costs, which is twelve point two percent of the gross domestic product. The only country that pays more is the United States, which pays sixteen point nine percent of gross domestic. Uh, health costs, or about ten thousand five hundred and eighty-six uh, per person in health care. Yet Bernie doesn't want to talk about his, how his plan will save in total costs compared to the Biden plan or Medicare for America plans, uh, which is over a hundred percent savings uh, as it is now at four percent. Why do you think Bernie doesn't want to talk of? about how much better his plan is concerning costs. And then I got a couple other questions. Do you agree that the more you go into details, the more it helps the proponents of Medicare for all? And how do you, how do you see the state of Medicare for all now that the medical industry has spent uh, tens of millions of dollars trying to stop it, and uh, which has former proponents of Medicare for all, like Harris and Booker, moving away from Bernie's bill? I mean, I think uh, I think people are afraid of the, um, you know, you lose your private health insurance thing. And I think it's it's been um, it, it, it's it's a hard people just hear that and they they don't frankly have the the there, there's just not enough information out there of what that really means. Like, you know, nobody wants to lose anything. Um, and. The uh, in, in some respects, like I remember that that polling of uh, people were saying like uh, th- there was a poll taken where th- they had talked about what Republicans had done. I can't remember what else. Roll back something. 
And the people in the focus group were like, we don't believe that. And I think to a certain extent, I think it's hard for, for some people to sort of like conceptualize of like, wait a second, is that actually possible? You could get that kind of uh, coverage. You could get that kind of access uh, for that kind of cost. I think it's hard for people to believe it on some level. And so the, I think that it's, um, I think, you know, threatening that something's going to be taken away, away is, is more uh, effective. Now, with that said, I think when we get down, and hopefully this will happen sooner rather than later, but I don't know that it will. When we get down to like four or five people in a debate, I think there's going to be more room for that type of stuff. But hopefully we get there soon. John, I appreciate the call. All right. Thank you. And uh, the way you started that call. I appreciate that, too. That was very great. Colin from the 360 area code. 360. Hey, this is Brett from Washington. Brett from Washington. What's on your mind? Hi. I feel a little overshadowed by the GM workers right now, but I was wondering if I could get a horn of support for the workers of Highland Court Memory Care that are trying to unionize right now. <laughs> Where are they in the process? Uh, well, last week we marched on our boss with 70% of our workforce, and they, she had no idea it was coming. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, to all listeners out there, if you ever got the opportunity to do that, you should, because it was a pretty magical moment. I bet. Did anybody videotape it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did get a videotape. Oh, well, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, uh, I think the, like... The union rep. Yeah, you want to... The union rep took that. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, that, I mean, uh, probably, I would imagine, for uh, potential evidence in the event that there is an attempt to, <laughs> to uh, punish those people who are involved in the unionization. Well, good luck with it, and keep us updated. Yeah, I will. Thank you. All right, thanks for the call. Um, let's go uh, some... Uh, Here's uh, Donald Trump being asked about the uh, UAW uh, strike, GM strike. Um, and um, what did he say? How many jobs do you think he was going to return? Or uh, like, I, I, He had a lot of promises. Um, during all that. of them, I yes. believe. I think Every oh, single one. They're going to be so great. Here he is uh, being asked... Um, if he stands with the auto workers in the strike against GM. Now, I'll be really surprised if we don't see uh, some Democratic candidates uh, again, getting uh, to uh, Detroit. Who is? Tim Ryan is already. Is he Is he still in the race? Oh, don't throw your back out, bro. All right. Well, there you go. Well, good. I mean, no, good look, that he's no, going. The best thing Tim Ryan could do in his life is give them some tuna fish sandwiches. Right. And I mean in his life. Make yourself useful. Well, I have great relationship with the auto workers. I got tremendous numbers of votes from the auto workers. Uh, I don't want General Motors to be building plants outside of this country. As you know, they built many plants in China and Mexico, and I don't like that at all. Uh, my relationship has been very powerful with the auto workers, uh, not necessarily the top person or two, but the people that work uh, doing automobiles. Nobody's ever brought more. Uh, companies into the United States. You know, I have Japan and Germany and many countries have been bringing car companies in and opening plants and expanding plants and big things are happening in Ohio, including with Lordstown. A very positive things are happening. Uh, we have many plants that are either being renovated or expanded or built new right now in the United States. Many more than we've had for decades and decades. So nobody's been better to the auto workers than me. He just yaks it's and yaks and yaks. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, it better be somebody that can run credibly against him. God, though. I would love to see him face off against Bernie on labor issues. Holy crap. Oh, really? Because Here, that sounds like a whole lot of nothing. This is a piece. Uh, what happened to all the jobs that Donald Trump promised? Um, so he promised about $8.9 million. Mm. Um, if you go down... Uh, oh, and this gives, oh, it's a nice graphic. It shows how few of those jobs he actually. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working well with the browser here, though. But basically, very few. Um, not, 797 are But directly. they like me. 
They like me. 797 directly attributed to Trump. So out of 8.9 million. So hmm. it's a little thin. Little thin. Um, so uh, mentioned earlier, uh, Elizabeth Warren, big rally in New York. This came, uh, this rally w- coincided with, uh, and, and probably by design, um, the Working Family Party of New York endorsed, uh, or not, excuse me, Nationwide uh, endorsed Elizabeth Warren. Um, I don't know how many actual members they have nationwide. It's you know, it, it, it in certain states it's actually like a party that actually uh, fields a ticket. In New York, it's a fusion party, and uh, which is in jeopardy because uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo may be signing legislation to eliminate fusion parties in this uh, in this state. He Goodbye. is active, and I think that that is. Um, Probably part of the reason why Elizabeth Warren got this endorsement. Now, here's the thing that's a little bit um, a little bit sticky in terms of um, in 2015, the Working Families Party based its presidential endorsement entirely on a membership vote and released the vote results. It was 87 percent for Bernie. This time, what it did is it did something different, which was. We're going to allow the membership to vote. And then we're going to allow the leadership to vote. I don't know how many people constitute the leadership. I think it's somewhere a couple dozen, maybe up to 50 people. The membership could be up to close to 40,000 people. And they weighted those two groups equally. And now... In 2015, obviously, we saw the full uh, data in, in, in 2018 or 19. We're not going to. They're not going to release it. Um, so, so we don't know. Certainly, it's within the purview, obviously, of a group to uh, endorse whoever they want. It's just, uh, it's just a question of how much they're going to be listening to their leadership. There was some controversy about this during, uh, you know, particularly some of the unions uh back in uh 2015 to a certain extent there's a a greater value for groups like this to endorse early my understanding too is that the working families party is going to want to get involved in outside expenditures independent expenditures from the campaign um which involves fundraising and gives them an opportunity in the event that in New York they're shut out to sort of redesign what kind of entity they are. Bernie Sanders does not take uh, independent expenditures um, and it does not uh, want those. So there wasn't the same opportunity for Sanders. So there's a lot of administrative reasons uh, why one might do this. It is the DSA is doing an independent expenditure campaign for Bernie, though. I, I don't, uh, that may be the case, but I don't know to what extent that, that they're, they're going to be happy with that. But Yeah, no, maybe. they didn't ask for it, but we're um, doing it. And, um, but what's a little bit problematic with this endorsement is it's not clear if they, I don't know, um, the, the, the head of the, uh, Maurice Mitchell was on with Chris Cuomo. Maurice uh, Mitchell is the, I think the executive director of the Working Families Party. And he was on with uh, Chris Cuomo, and it did not go great. And I think if you listen, it might be clear uh, why. We have Maurice Mitchell. He's the national director for the Working Families Party. Joining me now, pleasure to see you. Pleasure, Chris. Thanks for having me. So why Warren and not Sanders? So let me just first say that it's 2019, and we have two structural change big, bold, progressive candidates that um, have built huge grassroots followings in the democratic process. But you picked one. Why? Right. And so our grassroots members and our volunteers and our state committee, we engaged in a very long process and we came out. And I'm so proud of the process and so proud that we chose Elizabeth Warren. And let me tell you why. So, I mean, if you look at her, you know, they joke about she has a plan for it, right? But if you look at it and, and you take a step back. So the Green New Deal, so we could save the planet. Um, Pause it for one second. Right, go on. Well, wait a second. Uh, Elizabeth Warren does have 
a uh, client plan. But Bernie Sanders has specifically signed on to something called the Green New Deal. May I just say, in this case, the distinction matters, rewrote the Green New Deal in its most ambitious and comprehensive iteration yet. He didn't just sign on to right. one. I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're distinct plans. And one is called the Green New Deal and one is not. Um, but go ahead. A historically big picture uh, housing uh, policy, um, you know, uh, the Medicare for all, to take the insurance companies between you and your doctor, right? So uh, healthcare could be a right and not a commodity that's, that's traded. Bernie right? does the same things right? and he wrote the damn bill. That's, that's absolutely right. And, and we have so much respect for Bernie and his followers. And in 2016, we endorsed Bernie. In 2020, you have a field of dozens of candidates. And so we wanted to engage in a process that was deeply democratic, where we could decide early uh, what to do, even as the field was still shaking out. The reason we did it is because that time is one resource that when you lose it, you never could recoup. Fine. So what was the difference between the two with so much sameness? So what I could talk about positively is why we endorsed Warren. Um, and again, like I've, I've nothing but positive things to say about Bernie, his followers and his movement. And I think it's a plus for working people, the people that we represent, that we have two candidates that are advancing this. And I think, you know, you saw the debate stage where they flanked each other. Right. And so we want to encourage that with, you know, with uh, fellow travelers who agree with the policy change in both camps to to flank these ideas and to and to organize. And we encourage other organizations. I'm with you. But here's why I'm pushing. In. Please. Here's why I'm please, pushing. Let's go. Let's because go. Let's, do it. <laughs> no, let's get after it. Here's why. Yeah. Because you could argue they're splitting the vote. OK. And I'm asking you why her and not him when it was mm -hmm. him the last time. Mm -hmm. And when you say why you picked her, I'm, I'm not arguing with your reasons. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. You're allowed to your process. But they checked the same boxes. Well, listen, we did a ranked choice vote. So we didn't so just. This was a vote of members. This was a vote of members and our national committee, which are mm -hmm. grassroots uh, grassroots activists uh, that are part of people's organizations. And more voted for her than him. Absolutely. So that's what it was. And and and, and now we're moving forward with our candidate and Pause we couldn't it. be okay. more proud so i mean it's like mission they, impossible well i mean look i think there there was a way in the event that it is the case that m literally more people in their organization voted for warren that you start out with that you start i mean like you know cuomo was like had to w w basically walk him all the way there um you start out, well, look, people voted that way. Why did they vote way, that way? I'm not 100% sure because I can't talk to each one of them. But I can tell you that um, we're talking about two candidates with uh, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, I, I'm just, it is. Um, now, there is, I've also seen this reporting. People familiar with the WFP endorsement process say they expected a closer vote, but that Warren and her team had impressed members with organizing muscle that put a premium on engaging members, asking for feedback and building relationships. I mean, I have heard reporting to the fact that um, they did a very good job of, of courting uh, WFP members, uh, that, um, that Warren had come out in support of, uh, of a candidate. I can't remember where it was. Maybe it was in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's quite possible, but they should just release the numbers. Exactly. Because they had done it in the past. And that makes it, I mean, at that point, it's like, how do you argue with it? People want, exactly. if that's who they want to endorse, that's who they endorse. But it reeks of it being not the democratic process that they're selling. And, 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 and I think that's the only thing that's problematic about it. If this is true, I mean, even Warren's side say release the vote that showed that I impressed members with my organizing muscle. Exactly. It's very simple. I would just like to add, though, too, I mean, <laughs> regardless of how this shakes out with the vote, and obviously there would be a lot, there would be less to say in terms of their endor. I mean, I think you can have a substantive debate, debate on anything, and the substantive debate I would have is, I mean, Warren just released her health care plan, which uh, Ben Burgess pointed out, in addition to some real remaining ambiguity about the Medicare for All aspect, the language on mental health is distinct from general health and what she put in her own site, which is worth considering. Sanders' plan is comprehensive. 
And, you know, WFP have said from the beginning, as far as I understand, that single payer is one of their core missions. They also talk, he mentioned housing. There's only one candidate with a homes guarantee. So, you know, even if it is a coherent vote, and that remains to be seen, there's going to be a lot of challenge on the merits because he, I mean, well, precisely because of I what mean, he just did. I don't know. I mean, no, I mean, literally, he just he just listed the reasons to support one well, candidate, which it, were the policies of the other those, candidate. It's bizarre. That, well, the... He could get away with that if the vote simply if said. If the members voted that way. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. And well that's why I said the like, substantive debate would still. T- well, no, there's, I mean, still I mean, a substantive debate like, actually matters, of course. I mean, but then the debate is like a WFP. If, if the members well, voted this, for Warren, then that makes our conversation about the WFP different, which is that like they're going right. to like, right. But if the members are still like well, 75% then that's a, that's earning. That's the right. difference between a substantive debate I mean, and look, a scandal. Listen, I mean, right. it's a scandal. In the first but scenario, I think it could be a scandal. that's a scandal. If they actually overrode their their voters and it is odd they're being so non-transparent about it then that's a much deeper problem right either way it is a problem is my point i I mean look i think it's uh uh you know you could argue on the the basis of merits that maybe their argument is like well she uh if they all voted that way uh there was a reason why they voted and i imagine they would articulate it uh maybe it is like she did a better good uh, job of like wooing uh, different constituencies within the WFP. And, um, you know, uh, he can go out, Maurice can go out and uh, try and assess why 50,000 people voted a certain way, but that's all he's doing is he's just, he's just making some type of broad assessment. Um, But it's hard to get away with that. You know, like this is not, a clip I would have played if it was, you know, they released it and 55% of the people uh, in the WFP total voted for a warrant. I sure would have. And then I would have played it. And then I would have done an intro to a concept called false consciousness, which you like in other contexts. So maybe you should apply it to this one a bit. Well, I mean, I, 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 I think you're all about blaming the electorate. You're not a But we don't know how electorate. much to blame them. Well, that's the well, point. Fair enough. Fair I think enough. we all but they, know. But, 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 but we also don't know that this one guy can fully articulate why uh, 50,000 people voted. They I don't think voted. one person can articulate false consciousness. That's a hard well, thing. Whatever. I think we all know why they're being <laughs> we so We blame shady all electorates. We it's, don't. It's, that's they the point. would have released the numbers if the numbers said that everyone voted overwhelmingly for Warren. One, well, even if it, they, even if it was 51%. Even if it was close. I mean, why be. couldn't you come out and say, I'm the leader of this organization and they voted 51% for, uh, for Warren. I feel great about Bernie. I feel great about Warren. This is our membership has spoken. We're going to work our butts off. If uh, Bernie Sanders wins, we're also going to work our butts off. I mean, I mean, what it comes down to is the Working Families Party is much more comfortable in the world of liberal NGOs and in the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, which is, you know, a part of the establishment than they are being the sort of rightward flank of something more left than that. Like their board the was like, if Bernie wins, we won't get cucked by Cuomo as easily. No, like, and I, like the DSA I, works I, in coalition with them on a lot of things, but this is one area where we're not going to Frankly, see eye to eye. I would, I would probably imagine it's less about that type of ideological assessment and probably in the event that it was the board that overrode uh, their membership, I would argue it's probably more consistent with what we're seeing in North Carolina with those, um, with those uh, state senators who are willing to vote for a gerrymandered district right, that's that the point. maintain the power of Republicans to save their own seats. Yeah, well, I think that's I'm the point she was making. It's not purely ideological. It I, also goes back to who's giving them money. Well, no, no. I think, like I said, and the reporting I have seen is that in supporting Warren, they can change their operations in a way that give their organization long-term viability and that opportunity wasn't there with Sanders. And so um, that is different from an ideological uh, debate. And it's also different in terms of like who is funding him. It's just simply a, you know, an operational uh, sustainability argument. And, And that is. Well, it's both, right? Because it produces an ideological outcome even if that's not the root cause behind it, right? Well, yeah, it might. But like I say, like that may not be the... Like the, endorsing Warren over Sanders is an ideological outcome. 
Yes, but, it is an ideological outcome, but but that doesn't necessarily they they may not see the. We can the endorse the candidate of the I'm less concerned class. about the ideological outcome than and more about the democratic outcome in this case right now. I'm concerned about all of it. Yeah, we should be concerned about all of it. But like, I didn't have that much faith in the Working Families Party to begin with because I know they're more comfortable in the world of liberal NGOs and right. in the Democratic Party establishment. I guess that's why I'm saying I, I'm I more concerned. I just think that that framing of they're more comfortable is naive and silly and does not look at power. It's not a question of comfortability. It's a question. And, and I'm not I'm not being an apologist for them. I'm just saying that that analysis, I think, is silly. It's not a question of like, I like these people well, more. No, I'm not oh, you're, saying you're that they like the vibe. No, but you're misunderstanding what she's saying. She's saying that if I understand you correctly, they have carved a market niche for themselves, which goes precisely to what you're just right. saying. So I what don't is a think word that's the this? case. Yeah. It's you not don't a case think, of their, they've carved wait, a market niche for themselves. Hold on. I, hold, no. Let me complete a thought before you react. So then you can know what you're reacting to. I, the point I'm reacting to carved a niche. Okay. I'm suggesting to you they're you not carving said, a niche. You literally just said it's analogous to the North Carolina example. Right. It's not right. a question of them carving a niche That's for themselves. That's not a career niche? That's no, no, no. That's not a place in the market. It's a question of survivability, which is not necessarily okay. giving you an ability to carve, that they, they are at the mercy of the, 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 the unions. The unions basically undercut them in their fight with Cuomo, and because Cuomo had the ability to offer the, the unions money and transactional benefit. This does not contradict then, anything that we've said that you thought you were contradicting. So what's the disagreement? It's not a question of carving a niche. It's a, it's a question of them, a, a, a niche that is like their branding. It is right. simply literally no, looking like literally for literally how they exist. Well, right. Carving a niche for, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, how about. they continue to How function. do they exist? How do right. they get funded? Where do they exist in a marketplace? Maybe the niche that they have created in terms of funding, and let's not get tricky and, you know, pend uh, let's not be pederasts about specific words. Maybe where they have created an existence for themselves in a political ecosystem might, in fact, as an example, get uprooted by exactly what you're saying. A Sanders campaign that says, we're no. less interested in your third party expenditure. We're less interested in the role as brokers that you might be playing. I mean, come on, man. That's not you're, that complicated. No, but you're, to you're out. looking at it in the opposite. You're looking at it backwards. No. That the point is I that they so. are just looking for, it's like they're looking for daylight and they only see daylight in one area and they're not in control of that. Like they don't have the opportunity, they don't have the ability to create the opportunity. I'm confused They're how only you think a you're seeing what is. I don't. Okay, I don't see how you think you're contradicting what I'm or Jamie are saying, though. I it's mean, it's not the, a question of their comfortability. They could be very uncomfortable in this okay, situation. Okay, they're uncomfortable. But it's the only needs. place. All right, all right, let go of that word. We're making. We're talking I, I didn't about bring where they exist. Okay, we were talking yeah, about where they. This seems like a semantic. Yeah, I mean, it's super semantic. This is where they exist in the marketplace is affecting how they're endorsing is not that complicated. And, and you're saying can, and you're literally saying the same thing. Like, it, come on. This would all be clear if they release the vote totals and we could understand right. how membership voted distinct from the board. Right. But you know what? Bernie doesn't need the Working Families Party. All right. I mean, needs... it would. It wouldn't. I mean, obviously, it it would help. Um, it, not after I'm done with their brand. It doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's going to hurt him that much in the end. I think it's going to reflect poorly on them and probably hurt them more. Yeah, I think it definitely. The I same way endorsing Crowley over AOC did. This is just the next step. Absolutely. They're a trash brand. Um, I don't know. I appreciate the, the work they did with Cynthia Nixon because I think uh, New York is a very different place because of it. I think the IDC, I mean, I think there's value in an organization like that. I think we can see the limits of it, though. You know, sure. I mean, I think it just, you know, it's like it, 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 it is, I think, a, um, it does not, re it is not a, an analysis of power and an assessment of like what their value is and the limits on it. Like just sort of, you know, I, that that's, that's that's all I'm talking about is some level of specificity about. as to where their their limits on their value is, but there's still value. I mean, well, that's a separate question. I mean, no, <laughs> is wait, wait wait. I'm sorry. I okay. I don't want to be like you here. You don't think that there is. I'm. I don't want to be a pederast either. You don't think there's a distinction between 
saying where they have value, the limits of that run of how that runs up against broader structural forces versus acknowledging that they might have a limited utility. Those are the same thing. They are not the same thing. They are absolutely not the same thing. Just the that, limits I mean, of their utility are not the same if, as the limits of their utility? Is that what you're I saying? Did, I said two separate things. You said the definition of their, the limits of their power versus the limits of their utility. No, I said that in one environment, as an example, Bill de Blasio in 2012, 2013, is a net positive in national politics. In today's context, national politics has completely moved ahead of him. So his value has diminished. The context in which he operates in is significantly diminished. And he can move with that and change or not. Those are definitely different things. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't... This is why I like to keep it to just make the votes public. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> meanwhile... The utility. Meanwhile... Yesterday we spoke about uh, Chris Coons getting out in front of his skis um, in terms of like uh, heading on Fox and Friends to talk about how Iran was a real uh, problem. Somebody got to Chris Coons. Now, it's quite possible he's watching uh, the majority report and took some of this criticism to, to heart. I find that unlikely, but it's not. Yeah, it's totally inconceivable. Uh, but nevertheless, somebody got to Chris Coons. Because um, that beeping sound that you're hearing, that is Chris Coons backing up. That you felt that if the intelligence suggested that Iran was behind it, that you thought that military action could be warranted. Do you still feel that way now? Well, notice the two conditions uh, in that statement. You know, first, we in Congress need to be briefed on the intelligence. Well, it is important what's reported on the news. Um, we need a detailed briefing on the Pause intelligence. It. and I've Now, this guy goes on Fox and Friends yesterday at the slightest whiff. And then all of a sudden someone said to him, hey, dude, it's the Trump administration. It wasn't even the Trump. It was Brian Kilmeade. Well, he I'm saying, no, no, said, no. But my point being that, like, he's going off of, of the story that he had heard. He was so desperate to carry this uh, forward. And apparently someone said, um, you might want to take a second look at this. We need a detailed briefing on the intelligence, and I've asked for that and I'm hoping to get that. Um, what you've just reported would certainly strengthen um, the evidence, uh, if confirmed by intelligence, to members of Congress um, that this was a direct attack by Iran on uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, second, um, we need to have a conversation uh, as a country and as a Congress about whether or not this is an attack um, so directly relevant to America's interest as to justify military action. Diplomatic action is what's called for first, and our president should come to Congress and make that case if he is determined that this is what calls for military action. My concern here, Allison, is that Iran is an aggressive power, is a regionally destabilizing power um, that is clearly uh, willing to use uh, additional resources, if that's what this intelligence uh, bears out, um, to carry out more direct attacks that are more destabilizing against its regional opponent, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, Iran has projected force into Syria, into Lebanon, into Iraq, uh, into Yemen. Um, and this latest incident uh, could well be the next step in the escalation uh, of challenges. Um, I appreciate that President Trump's most recent statement on this was that he is not seeking war with Iran. Yeah. Uh, and it's my hope that after an intelligence briefing, um, those of us here in the Senate who serve on foreign relations, intelligence, and armed services uh, we'll have the opportunity for a meaningful debate about what is the best course of action going forward. Well, I, I you know, the, the, I mean, this is this is a pretty severe reversal by Chris Coons. I mean, he's backing off this big time. I imagine I, 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 I don't know. Maybe it's some notion of like uh, you really don't want to be on this side of a, a, war, a war that uh, Donald Trump is going to wage right now. I mean, he's still doing the Iran fear mongering, and I I looked but it's him more up. more generic. I mean, oh, it's much more generic. I mean, it somebody was must anyway. have told him something, because yeah, I I haven't seen a reversal like that in other. I guess actually nice since uh, Kamala Harris, uh, <laughs> so like, I didn't hear that. You love to see it. Uh, meanwhile, you love to see it. You love to see the reversals. Dave Rubin has blocked me, but uh, Ben Shapiro still is alive. And uh, so here he is, uh, Ben Shapiro, 
Well, he's got two gems. Let's start with um, the just the. I don't know which one is more egregious, <laughs> to be honest with you. But uh, this is Ben Shapiro reacting to the, um, the latest re- uh, revelations uh, about Brett Kavanaugh that uh, Brett Kavanaugh had said during his hearings, had he done something to uh, like that uh, to that uh, um, uh, his schoolmate Ramirez um, back in Yale, it would have been all over Yale. And uh, it turns out the reporting... Bears out that, in fact, it was all over Yale. Um, and this, of course, is the accusation that Brett Kavanaugh, drunken at a drunken party, uh, whipped out his penis and um, smacked um, uh, Ramirez in the face with it. And uh, Ben Shapiro has an interesting take on this, which, um, well, let's just hear it. We have had a bevy of public figures in recent years who have had their genitalia described on national television by people who allege sexual assault. Right? Stormy Daniels famously described President Trump's genitalia. Bill Clinton's genitalia. Details of such... Pause were, it for one second. Talking. I want to make something clear. Stormy Daniels had consensual uh, sex in an affair with multiple um, uh, encounters with Donald Trump. That is not sexual assault. Uh, what's that? No, I think it was twice. And uh, I know (laughs) one time, shame on you twice. Shame on me. Um, Bill Clinton also his uh, relationships. I think in terms of when the genitalia was described, uh, I believe was uh, consensual. Um, Again, let's let's see. Maybe he has another example. Trump's genitalia, Bill Clinton's genitalia. Details of such were, were talked about. Nobody has yet described Kavanaugh's genitalia. Now, that's not dispositive. Maybe they were generic. Who knows? But the bottom line is we've had no corroborating know. details on any of these stories. All of them apparently happened in public places with other witnesses available, and not one witness has been there who corroborates any of these stories. It's unbelievable. And yet the Democrats are still saying that Kavanaugh should be kicked off the Supreme Court based on what, a new report from a guy who says that he was at a party and saw a male grab Kavanaugh's penis, which, by the way, would be sexual assault, and then thrust it into the hand of a female who says she doesn't remember the incident? It seems like you might remember that incident. I'm just going to put that out there. That if you're a female innocently sitting at a party and suddenly some dude comes and takes someone else's junk and thrusts it into your hand, it feels like that might be memorable. I'm going to go to the woman in the room. Jess, does that seem like a memorable incident to you? It seems like a memorable incident to Jess. I will take Jess as generic woman here because I think that that is a fairly memorable incident. I think any normal person You know what's amazing about this? So he's talking about this new revelation, this new accusation from a guy who incidentally clerked for Clarence Thomas. But on one hand... Shapiro is saying, well, if the uh, the alleged victim doesn't remember it or claims that she doesn't remember it, uh, I think you would remember that. Yet he's also when he talks about the lack of a description of the penis. He is uh, not accepting the remembrance of this woman, Ramirez, (laughs) who is the initial victim, right? Like he's discounting the third accusation to come up. We should do and a Ben Shapiro remake of the Dave Chappelle uh, sketch where he but will not. I, I'm curious. I, I can tell I, you exactly what his penis 20, looks like. 25 years ago, um, and probably even more recently, uh, in terms of like I've been in like uh, Wise and like um, you know uh, athletic centers, I have been in showers. I have seen other men's genitalia. I will tell you this: I cannot describe it. I wouldn't even know how to describe it. Sure, I, I very, everyone believes you. <laughs> I could do it <laughs> generically, but let's watch. Uh, just like I mean, this is just absurd. But let's uh, let's uh, let's just go back and watch uh, this without sound because it is just as revealing, I think, uh, to watch just, Ben Shapiro get very very animated when he is talking. <laughs> That he believes that if you have been uh, assaulted by someone's penis, that you should be able to describe it. I mean, can you imagine just for a moment, though, that if Ramirez actually did say this, like, what? what's the next step? Is Ben Shapiro going to call for an examination of Brett Kavanaugh's penis to find out if it's uh, accurate 
an accurate description. And Whip like, it out. Like exactly. That would've been great. What Release would the hog imagine? Photos. Amy Klobuchar is like, there's really only com- one common sense Minnesota answer to this. And that Brett needs to take it out right here. It's unbelievable. And we can see here, if there's contemporary uh, Shapiro. Account. Shapiro. He just I wants just to know what the hog looks like. There he is. We've all been there. He's... Here because I think that that is a fairly memorable incident. I think any normal person would probably remember that. And if called by the New York Times. Normal person. Oh, were you at a party where someone grabbed somebody's junk and thrust it into your hand? <laughs> Seems like it might be memorable. There you go. Hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah. Don't worry, Ben. Demon. I'm sure you'll get a really graphic description image of the of the dick soon. Now. To satisfy you. Yeah, there you go. Um. Now, uh, Ben Shapiro is, um, uh, it's quite clear from this clip, is aspiring to be his generation's Bill O'Reilly. Now that uh, Bill O'Reilly is out to pasture, um, Shapiro needs to fill the void with exactly the same take that Bill O'Reilly had 15 years ago. 100%. And can I just say, just like Bill O'Reilly, and I'm not talking about, you know, whatever there's no nothing about ben shapiro's personal life i'm talking but the this is the quintessential one block hey whatever this republican politician did we don't even understand whatever and the next block is black people's music is ruining everything right exactly <laughs> like i mean the idea you know like, like the idea that this would even be a topic in this, like, I can understand it, like, back when O'Reilly, you know, back in, like, oh, oh, you know, oh, you know, oh, one or oh, two, he's like, this newfangled rap music, which, of course, at that point was probably 20 years uh, old. But, like, this newfangled rap music, it's, it, it sounds like noise, but it's just sort of like, are you serious? In this era of music, like, where it's just sort of, there's just so many genres, there's so much more music now than there was, like, yeah. 30 years ago because of, like, digital you know, uh, availability. And, and I mean, make a playlist, Ben. It's to, so nineties. This is it, it, honestly, it is, it's shocking. Um, and how the only thing I can say is that it takes, I don't think they had the technology back in the aughts or in the nineties to place the mentality of a 68 year old man into a body this young. And that's maybe why they had to wait until now. Here's Ben Shapiro uh, basically showing off this new medical technology that has inserted the ideas of a 68-year-old man who lived 20 years ago into the body of a, I don't know, 30, 40 some odd. 35-year-old man baby. My case against rap is I, I have the musical case against rap, and then I will get to the cultural case okay. against rap. So, so the, the musical case against rap is that in, in my view and the view of my music theorist father who who went to music school the there are three elements to music there is harmony there is there is melody and there is rhythm okay. and rap only fulfills one of these the rhythm section that there's not a lot of melody and there's not a lot of harmony mm. and thus it is basically effectively spoken rhythm and so it's not actually a form of music it's a it's a form of rhythmic speaking uh, and and thus i and so beyond the subjectivity of me just not enjoying rap all that much uh, it, it's it, what I've said before is it's not me. Oh my God. Oh God. Who is the black guy who's getting paid to laugh? Like he said something hilarious. Uh, it's a Zuby. I believe he's a UK rapper who famously decided he was going to start declaring this, uh, identifying as female to break uh, powerlifting records. So he's mm. kind of a mm. gimmick artist. Good. And, um, do we do, I mean, I'm curious about Ben Shapiro's father since he's uh, brought his father into this. Was Ben Shapiro's father also like believe like it was was he raised Orthodox? I wonder if his dad what his dad's beliefs are on other things that uh, we should also be in, inserting into the culture. Like maybe uh, women shouldn't be wearing uh, skirts above the knees or something like that. Sort of fascinating. My dad is the foremost authority on uh, music, and uh, he says it's not music. I don't know if it ended up being true or not, but there was somebody who had a theory that uh, he was sock- Ben Shapiro's dad was sock puppet boosting Ben Shapiro's social media posts. <laughs> I've never heard of. I believe that, that theory. I one hundred percent believe that theory. Uh, meanwhile, since we're in this um, um, in this neighborhood, Stephen Crowder <laughs> has been uh, pushing. Yeah, let's just go through the whole thing. 
Uh, you know, uh, the NRA and one of the revelations of uh, the NRA that um, there were two years of state investigations, and numerous lawsuits. The NRA stopped offering its carry guard self-defense insurance products. The uh, the NRA uh, rolled out the carry guard in 2017. It's a multi-tiered insurance program offered with policies up to $150,000 in criminal defense reimbursement and a million dollars in civil liability protection. Uh, it, it it basically <laughs> it was defense coverage for criminal actions. Essentially, right? Like if you accidentally shoot somebody or criminally shoot somebody, they would now in this didn't uh, stick in, in, in New York because the NRA was based in New York. So they were subject to New York regulations. It's quite possible that uh, firearmslegal.com firearm legal protection is a, an insurance company somewhere else. And so they are able to get away with this. But here's Steven Crowder with not only selling a uh, some type of junk insurance program, but also doing one of the world's worst ads for it. Yeah, it's unclear if they produce this ad or not, or if they're just reproducing it. But uh, this is a scene which is going to, in some way... Um, I guess, capture when you would need this insurance. Sir, whatever you want, just take it and leave. <laughs> Gonna get you. Sir, I have a <laughs> firearm, and if you don't leave, I will use it. Oh, 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 I'm coming for you. I will shoot. Here I come. Oh, what the hell? What did you expect? I am gonna sue you so hard. You can still face ridiculous civil liability with the defensive use of your firearm. That's why you need firearms legal protection. With our 24-7 emergency hotline and plans designed specifically for the Now we need to stop here for a second. First off, I, I, that voice on the other side of the door sounded a lot like Steven Crowder to me. Now maybe it wasn't. Uh, and then, of course, they get this, uh, you know, uh, Neck beard. Brooklyn hit, hipster. I love this, this guy. <laughs> just like they were just like, hey, are you tired court? of making soy lattes? You want to be a judge and right. sentence gun owners to jail for civil cases? But here's the Job interesting thing. Yes, you. it's supposedly I'm going to sue you. And apparently uh, the lawsuit was uh, for putting hand. Uh, we're going to I'm going to I want put handcuffs on you as my uh, compensation. <laughs> Um, which, of course, does not happen in the context of lawsuits. What also doesn't happen is that the uh, court officer, when they come to cuff you, uh, they don't reach for your hands that are behind your back and then somehow magically uh, p- put the cuffs on in front of you. This, the, this is, I mean, I hate to be a critique of the filmmaking here, but watch this. Watch, watch the, uh, the cut where they go for the hands behind the back. But you can still face ridiculous civil what? liability with the defensive no, use of your firearm. That's Sorry, why you okay. need firearms legal See, protection. See, they come behind him. They're with our 24-7 <laughs> emergency hotline <laughs> and plans designed and specifically in front for of the his firearms thing. owner, firearms legal protection is the best legal protection you can have for self-defense. There you go. So uh, they will, and uh, it's unclear uh, what they'll provide. Uh, somehow they will make sure that you don't go to jail if you get uh, sued. I'll just say, if you do have a gun for self-defense, maybe don't shoot blindly through doors. I, you know, that's the amazing thing. Like, I'm going to get you. Only well, there's somebody's on the other side of it going, hey, 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 I'm right. going to get you. Like, I, I'm just I was knocking like, on my friend's door. <laughs> I'm just picturing some monster from like Fraggle Rock or something that just like eats bullets and spits them back out again and goes, ow. It's very it's weird. like, Fred, you shot another babysitter. Do we still have our murder insurance? Yeah, I think so. It's on auto pay. <laughs> God. All right. Let me call the police to remove the body. Uh, Cop cubs. It's like, well. Let's go to the phones. Call from a 308 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Who's this? This is Kowalski from Nebraska. Kowalski from Nebraska. What's on your mind? Well, I was just curious. 
I'm on a limited budget, but I've got my Patreon account out. Should I go with TMBS or the Majority Report? Whoa, Kowalski getting problematic. I think I you and I. I would prefer if only Jamie or Matt would give me an answer. Ooh, that, that's not the answers we're going to get. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just My answer with you. is I've, to I've support the Antifa. Yeah, you're I've just giving them opportunities yeah, to plug hangover. themselves. Patreon.com slash the Antifa. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, let's do it this way. I'm thinking a number between one and 10. Uh, why don't you tell me what the number is? Five. You got it. Majority report. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, actually, one of the things I did want to call in and uh, basically say is during the debate, I really don't think either candidate made a case for Iowa. Well, in in, in, in what sense? Well, both of them are, all the candidates kind of did touch on agriculture a little bit, but I really feel like they could really, really be making some headway against Trump if they just called out the trade war a little bit more. Like, one thing that needs to be pointed out is, like, the damage this has caused out in, like, agricultural America is, by and large, permanent now. Like, suicide rates are at a 35-year high, foreclosures, same. Uh, The amount of money that's being spent now in places like Latin America by U.S. companies and other companies that are getting, you know, subsidies or making infrastructure so, like, there will always be a glut of Latin American grain on the international market. Like the damage Trump has done is permanent. And the only way forward is a new vision. So, I mean, like that's something I really think Sanders needs to capitalize on and like, you know, really explain we're like the coal miners. Now it's the good old days are gone and we have to evolve. Wow. Well, what about also talking about the, I mean, like I know Sanders has an incredibly aggressive anti-monopoly plan. And it seems to me that if they talk about that, because, you know, as Brendan pointed out, they are debating in Texas, but you could talk about ag monopolies and corporations, you know, squeezing out uh, small business people and workers in a way that I think would synchronize the broader case about the rest of the economy. So I think that would, might be the way to go there. Um, and I'll see you on Patreon well, I'm just talking two to like one a, extra content. Specifically on like uh, Iowa. Like I feel like that would make a really big dent. No, I, I understand. still a large Democratic base out there for farmers. Iowa's weird. Well, uh, we along? I mean, I may, maybe they make that pivot in the general. I, I would be surprised if, 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 if I would be surprised if they don't make that pivot in the general. I think just in the um, in, in the in the primary, it may not have the same resonance um, uh, in the context of Iowa. But appreciate the call. And I will say this. Uh, Michael makes the case two to one uh, extra content on uh, TMBS. I think uh, we can all do rudimentary math here 45 50 minutes of uh, the free show on the majority report well, and it's almost an hour and a half afterwards all but... do the same level no, no, no. everybody needs to support you guys because if all of your subscribers gave just a dollar a month you're looking at millions so i mean yeah more or less year, I mean, so. oh no he's no he that is true if every single person who watched this for free on youtube gave each of us a dollar a month he's actually right Walsh is a everyone. businessman. He's a Republican leader with common sense solutions. I'll see you on Patreon, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> calling from a 301 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Is this me? Yes, it is you. Hello, this is uh, Connor. I'm calling from a formerly gang gang occupied territory. Uh, Connor from former Yang Gang territory. What what happened to uh, what happened to that territory? Um, well, honestly, you guys. But if you give me a second, I can kind of tell you how I got over there. Sure. Uh, um. Well, I got introduced to Andrew Yang just through like a video, and then I kind of got hooked in and started watching a lot of videos. And then when I ran out. I had to like watch interviews that he had. So I went, I wore somebody just commenting on him. And eventually I got to you guys and I was like, wow, you're a bunch of dicks. But then I wore my math hat long enough and I thought harder as the statement said, and then finally saw the light. 
Well, uh, I'm sorry that it was math, but uh, any way you can get there, it's good. I mean, I mean, look, I think there's. Um, uh, you know, that, that's like his catchphrase, like "Make America Think Harder." Oh, I didn't. I, I didn't pick. What up specifically on that. tipped you? Um. <clears throat> well, it's because I liked you guys so much, and I just thought, oh, you guys were wrong about Yang, but you're right about everything else. And then that just after I. I got hooked on the show and I kept watching, kept watching. I've been watching for like maybe two or three months now. And then just all the points started adding up and I was like, okay, maybe these guys got the right point of view. Hell yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's, he's been, I think it's been not a bad thing to have him in the, um, uh, the primary, frankly. I, mean, I think that I, perspective I like is helpful. I some of the things he raises. Um, I, I just don't like his uh, solutions. But yeah. he raises important things. Yeah, it's a yeah, good and I think, I think I that's agree. what initially kind of got me in was like he's like, oh, he's like he's getting the issue right. But then by the time he got to the solution and you got into the weeds a little more, you're like, oh, maybe this isn't the best way to go. Yeah, it's interesting because you know I was just thinking when uh, uh, Kowalski called about Iowa, um, I'm always reminded of Barack Obama in the months leading up to Iowa basically as a way of trying to, I think, drive um, uh, uh, the older vote, started talking about Social Security in crisis. And um, it was unclear at the time exactly what his solution was. But it, and, and frankly, it, it, Social Security was not in crisis. But identifying an issue that, um, whether it exists or not, or whether the characterization of the problem or not is accurate. <clears throat> For people who are older, Social Security is hugely important. And so if someone says, like, there's a problem with Social Security, no doubt. you're immediately communicating to them that, like, I'm thinking about things that could be problematic for you, even if it's not uh, a problem, Social Security. It just means that, like, oh, this person's watching out for me. And uh, and so I think, you know, that is one of the things I think I, I think Yang does articulate at least some of the problems that exist um, in in society. And then I just his solution, I'm not sure, is uh, the right one. But um, good for those people who who made the um, who won the lottery. And uh, seriously, but, but lotteries are not necessarily a, a, a structural solution. Appreciate the call. though. Thanks. Glad oh, yeah, to. but I'll be listening every day. Thanks Great. for what you guys do. I really love the show. Thanks. Appreciate your support. Uh, call from a 413 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? <coughs> Hi, Sam. Dave from the Berkshires here. Uh, is <coughs> hey, my Dave. speaker all right? Yep, you sound great. Okay. I wanted to comment on uh, the Kavanaugh discussion and wrote down my point, so I apologize if my delivery is a bit robotic, all right? No problem. Um, the, the first thing was uh, I think you were spot on on everything, you, all the points you made yesterday. Um, you know, please ask the mom if Kav, Kavanaugh is an example for their sons to emulate. Ask the moms if they are comfortable uh, sending their daughters out into the world populated by creeps like Kavanaugh. And uh, he's probably the one thing that infuriates me the most about this turd sandwich we are for, force fed daily. Um, because uh, as you point out, he lied to the entire thing and everyone paying attention knew he was lying and made it, and it made absolutely no difference. Um, and then pivoting to the call from Flamingo, who is one of my favorite callers, into the show, uh, he closed out going down a path that you seemed reluctant, reluctant to follow. Uh, is, am I correct in that assessment? Wait, I'm sorry. Say that again. Uh, well, he closed out the conversation kind of intimating some stuff about Biden and you weren't really, it didn't seem like you were comfortable, uh, in where he was going. Is that is that the way? Is that a correct read? What about what about what what? I, I don't, what do you think he was well, intimating? Flamingo. Well, I thought Flamingo was intimating that Biden and Kavanaugh were somewhat equal in their uh, guilt in regards to the women issue. No, I think I, my my sense was to the extent that I remember is that there's a quality of like uh, a certain arrogance 
not necessarily that they what they did was uh, equivalent, but their reaction to the idea that they commit any type of offense is similar. You know, Joe Biden okay. to me um, has I, I don't think that Joe Biden's perspective based upon what I understand, I don't I don't think what they did is equivalent. I think their ability to accept any measure of culpability, regardless of what it is, is similar. I uh, also thought he was saying they exist on a continuum of just crappy, misogynistic, patriarchal culture. I, I think that's the case. Yeah, too. absolutely. But uh, what, what else? What 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 else did you have? Um, well, I just think that Biden is vulnerable. Um, issues in regards to women i i and totally he, agree he, i think it's actually his, his vulnerability is even far greater i mean in in some ways maybe that theme peaked too early but you know anita hill yeah um and uh, you know is um people were mad at him for anita hill for a long time and in some ways i think that sort of peaked a little bit early it'd be interesting to see if that well the comes anita back. hill thing though that's the that's real i mean that's the one to really focus on and for what it's worth i will just say and i feel weird to quote this person but you know orrin hatch just dropped uh saying that uh you know biden told him personally he didn't believe anita hill now orrin hatch Shit. is trash, just now really? literally just now now, Orrin Hatch is trash, and Orrin Hatch is not someone to trust, but that is some, uh, that's what I would focus on. That's a real, the way he handled those hearings uh, is a real thing. Yeah, not to mention his incredible weakness on abortion rights. That's also a real thing. Yep. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate the phone um, call. Oh, you got one more? Well, okay. I, well, I just wanted to d just finish this off by saying that... Uh, I just imagine Trump going against Biden in a debate and nobody plays the I am rubber, you are glue game better than Trump. Uh, and I did have a Dr. Wolf thing. I just wanted to mention, I'm a former student of his uh -huh. and his class is one, one that made an impression throughout my life. So he gave this lecture on market fetishization. That's just amazing. So if you get him on, uh, again, just ask him to briefly describe it because oh. the guy's an amazing teacher. Um, thanks for everything you guys oh. do. And you definitely make this turd sandwich a little tastier. Oh, uh, well, that's. But that's thanks our, again. Take thanks. care. It's really pleasure. sweet. That is our uh, that is our uh, that is our one of our marketing programs. This turd's going to taste just a little bit sweeter. We'll use that blurb next to the Daily Stormer. All right. Do we, we have this Candace Owen? Thanks. Um, now do, where was this, uh, from, uh, Brendan, this is, okay. This is at the revolt summit. I don't know what the, I don't know what that even means. Um, really, but it's, um, and he's on, uh, and she, and, and Candace Owens there, on stage uh, with um, the rapper T.I. The rapper T.I. Um, and uh, apparently, you know, she's getting uh, questioned about her statements regarding slavery. And um, yeah, this is fun to watch what happens when uh, when when a conservative is out of her element. Uh, you call it and their safe space. Yeah, Exactly. But it's also uh, gives us an opportunity to debunk something since I've been so um, uh, heavily invested in the Civil War uh, for the past uh, couple of weeks listening to this, uh, this uh, podcast thing. Um, to uh, debunk uh, Candace Owens, one of her favorite claims. And this is all one of the favorite claims of the right. But here, let's take it from the beginning here. Um, this is the rapper T.I. with Candace Owens. Which question. period was America great that we're trying to replicate? Well, I, Which era was it? Tell me. I think. Pause it now. We should just be clear here that that, that, that um, he's asking, um, as a, a black person in America, which era? Is Donald Trump trying to replicate from the perspective of a black person that we want to replicate, as opposed to, I guess, move forward. <laughs> 
uh, and uh, go into a better era. Which era was it? Tell me. I think I'll answer your question. Tell I'm me. I'm ready to answer your question. Which era was it? What? Which era was so great? You, here's the thing that you guys are forgetting. America was actually one of the first... Slavery was all over the world. The all question. over the world. America Man, was... I'm not, I'm not saying it's okay, so why are you saying, oh? Hey, Amen. America you was one of the first like countries... I want to like you question, so bad. I'm trying to answer so your question. I want to like you so much. I can't answer the I question. Hear you. I want to be able to hear them. If, 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 I want to be able to hear them. If I can't answer the question and you're just going to boo when I say a slavery was all over the world, which is a fact, why are you booing a fact? Because you're making light of... No, I'm not. You're making light of... Wait, making light of the enslavement I'm not of people that look like us. You can't make right. light of that. That ain't nothing you breeze over. I haven't even over. finished the sentence. How am I making you light of anything? You started with some bullshit. Okay. <laughs> I think that is accurate. Um, but had he, uh, and I don't know what happens after that clip, but she was going on to make an argument that somehow America was uh, uniquely progressive in getting rid of slavery and just I, I I've heard conservatives say this now first of all I do not think there was I imagine perhaps maybe when we talk about we talk about like sort of late antiquity and maybe some other eras that you can find societies that were so uh driven economically by slavery but i do, i i think america was fairly unrivaled yes in world history in terms of building economic might i'm not talking just about domestic i'm talking about like like uh, internationally via slavery as a and it was not even just a a feature of society like society in for a large part of this country was built around slavery. Now, aside from that being fairly unique American phenomena, I'm sure in history, like there may have been like, you know, when we talk about the, the Roman Empire, um, hundreds of years, eras where slavery existed, it existed in this country for over 200 years. Slavery did. And it was a new kind of slavery, too. I mean, it, it, it was unique probably in terms of, uh, you know, it, it, world history. You could not but, buy your freedom the same way you could as a Roman slave, as an example. Very big functional difference. But Wise. let's just address the specific claim that America is one of the first countries to get rid of slavery. Uh, 1792. Denmark bans the import of slaves to its West Indies colonies. Now, this this is the this is the pattern for a lot of like the so you know the abolition movements. It will start first with you can't trade, you can continue to own your property. I'm using quotations because we're talking about human beings here, um, and uh, and certainly in the context of our country, you know the first thing. Uh, well, let's 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 not get to our country yet. 1807, Britain passes the abolition of slave tra slave trade act, outlawing the British Atlantic slave trade. United States passes the legislation banning the slave trade starting at 1808, but you still have uh, an enormous number of slaves in this country. Spain in 1811 abolishes slavery, including its colonies. 1813, Sweden bans slave trading. 1814, Netherlands bans slave trading. 1817, Fa France bans slave trading. Britain passes the Abolition of Slavery Act in 1833, ordering a gradual abolition of slavery in all British colonies. Portugal abolishes the slave trade in 1819. 1846, Danish governor proclaims emancipation of slaves in the Danish West Indies, uh, abolishing slavery. 1848, France abolishes slavery. 1851, Brazil abolishes slave trading. 1858, Portugal abolishes slavery in its colonies. 1861, Netherlands abolishes slavery in Dutch Caribbean colonies. Uh, in the United States, slavery was abolished in 1865 uh, via the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Between 
the time that the Netherlands abolished slavery and the time that we passed the 13th Amendment, 700,000 Americans died. So this was not a casual process in which uh, the slave uh, slaves were emancipated. In fact, it wasn't until halfway through the war that it was about the the war was about emancipating all slaves. Prior to that, it was to limiting the slave trade. Prior to that, was to say the Western uh, frontier was going to be slave free. Prior to that, it was just about we're going to contain in this area. And yes, President Lincoln tried to buy the slaves' freedom from the South. They had no interest. And so the idea that somehow America was uniquely good in the context of slavery is just completely ahistorical and diluted. Between 1836 and 1844, it was against the House rules to discuss slavery at all. You couldn't even bring it up. You couldn't even bring it up. Free speech. And then, I will say this too, that very quickly in the context of Reconstruction, you had what amounted to slavery with uh, basically tenant farmers they were not, you, you, as a freedman, you had no access to capital. You couldn't go, there was no, there was an attempt by, um, there was an attempt to, uh, to uh, start a, a bank that would loan to freedmen, but. Well, that's in that small period of time where the Northern the soldiers, st- right, in Reconstruction, where actually the, it's important to underline, and my, Killer Mike does later in that clip, that black people actually accumulated a lot of economic and political power in a very short period of time. In that period. And, and then it was, much and then of it, it was, was taken away. And then I it mean, was all you, taken away. It was taken at, away by political. And and there's a new Sidney Blumenthal book, actually, where he talks about, I mean, not only could you not have an idea conversation, in the 1850s, uh, Charles Sumner was Caney. beaten yes. on the floor of the Senate for talking about slavery. Yes. Physically. Attacked. Physically beaten. Well, even if we ignore all of that history and say, Mm, the U.S. was no worse than any other country in terms of slavery. That doesn't answer his question, right? Right. It was a complete deflection like, of like where you're going what to travel era was back. Good for black people. Well, all the other countries were bad for black people too. There was there was like there was a brief moment in Reconstruction. It was very it was very short. Um, there also was, and we did uh, an interview on the Northwest Territories, which at that time were Minnesota, Ohio, uh, Michigan, I think, um, in the 1840s, where there were, um, where there were free black folk who were, had very profitable farms. All of that was taken away by these states. They started to legislate. I mean, the uh, against property ownership for black people, et cetera, et cetera. I so. did an early illicit history. What was it, Matt? It was Wilmington, North Carolina. Yeah. And it was a, it was literally, I mean, this is in some ways a positive example. It was a multiracial coalition. There was a building between, uh, you know, blacks and reconstruction and poor whites to sort of generate, you know, some version of kind of b- development for the whole city. And a white terrorist clan group but was funded by oligarchs because they didn't like the labor protections. So it actually fits all of the modules that we talk about all the time. There's a Marxist angle. There's a white supremacy angle. There's a AstroTurf angle. And everybody knew this at the time. Like I have this uh, thing I discussed in the first episode of Literary Hangover, an essay by Sidney Smith, a, a Scotland, Scottish guy called Who Reads an American Book, basically saying like Americans are big on themselves now, but they haven't really produced anything. And it ends with this statement. Finally, under which of the old tyrannical governments of Europe is every sixth man a slave whom his fellow creatures may buy and sell and torture? And uh, when these questions are favorably answered, you can have your laudatory epithets. But like everybody knew this. All literature at the time is like justifying, even if it was apologetic, it at least had to deal with the fact that they say they're an empire of liberty while having s- enslaved people more, even more than the rest of Europe was at the time. Well, the um, the the argument was that uh, the South needs to have freedom to. <laughs> 
have its slaves. And economically, like the the northern states relied on that economy of like the sugar and later cotton plantations as much as the southern ones did. They were just a, a further down on the leg of the trade. Basically. Which is also how even in Europe it worked. Like I, everybody right, should of course, read King yeah. Leopold's Ghost because it's a brilliant piece about how like the campaign that you needed to have against the atrocities that they committed in the Belgian Congo was also some version of like some people in Britain being like, well, there's these new pamphleteers for human rights in Africa. Belgium's messed up. You should focus on that. Exactly. Yeah, where do you think That's the cotton came from in all of those new garment factories another, in England? Another good, uh, another good parallel to today, actually. That's an amazing book, I just have to say. King Leopold's Ghost. People always ask for book recommendations. That's one of the best books I've ever read. All right, folks. We've run out of time. Callers, I'm sorry. I apologize. We will uh, do some news. Oh, and tomorrow on the program, Billy Bragg will be uh, King. Will be coming on uh, That's I think a big at 1 p.m. Get. Yeah, it's huge. Gee, did he get blocked by Dave Rubin? He got blocked by Dave Rubin, yeah. and so he wanted to come on the show. All right, we will see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know. Somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shines I get somewhere the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid For the road that bends before it finally breaks you I get somewhere I lost my drive Between the 101